Hi, everyone, and welcome to Techno Crime Fighters Forum number 38. Um, we're so sorry we're a little bit late this morning. We've been trying to catch up with a few tech issues over here, which we're still kind of dealing with. Um, but I'm happy to be here with everybody, with um, Dr. Catherine Horton, with Karen Stewart, with Dr. Melissa Black. So hi, Catherine. Hi, Karen. Hi, Melissa. Good morning. Good morning. Hi. So, you know, I just wanted to once again um, give a little heads up to everybody new who's um, tuned in today to this channel just to say what Techno Crime Fighters Forum is all about and is striving to do is really alert the world to the um, to the gamut of atrocities that are currently being committed by ver by various perpetrators. Uh, but uh, among them, you know, a slew of intelligence agencies and military groups who are running weapons testing programs and non-consensual neurotech experimentation programs on the populace at large, both in the US and in Europe and in various countries around the world, you know, literally worldwide, Australia, New Zealand, everywhere. Everybody knows we're all one big happy family at this point in time, right, with one big intel agency running the show. So um, uh, that's what we're trying to do. We're just trying to, to speak out um, based on our own experiences of being assaulted and targeted and being hit with electromagnetic weapons and being hit with organized stalking and all sorts of really vile modern COINTEL Pro Star C programs. And we're also hopefully trying to bring forward the stories and the reports of um, many others as well who are speaking out around the world and um that's kind of what we're all about and uh you know we encourage you to watch our other videos and kind of catch up uh with what we've been doing so far because we've been running these shows for a little while now uh, we started at dr paul marco's channel and um now we're here at uh, at my channel and just continuing so um today for today's show I guess it's kind of going to be a catch-up show. We're going to tell you what each of us is doing currently, what we're working on, and um, each one of us has you know, different stories to tell and to bring to the table over here. Um, and we're also going to talk a little bit about current news with some of the news articles that have come out recently that appear to show a greater awareness in you know, the larger population um, about targeting which is really surveillance abuse and kind of a gateway to human trafficking and uh, weapons testing and neurotic uh, non-consensual experimentation. So on that note, um, maybe I'll turn the floor at this point um, over to Catherine, and she will um, talk about her experiences lately. Okay, hello everyone. I have to apologize for um, everything. I'm not actually at home. I'm currently in hiding. It could be that my audio and my video is absolutely atrocious. Um, it's kind of curious that you can, you, you know, you just flee your home and you're on hiding somewhere in Europe and somehow your video quality is much worse than that of Osama bin Laden who was apparently broadcasting from a cave. I think that uh, tells us something either, you know, I think something about his equipment and his DSL connection in that cave. But anyway. Um, so uh, apologies for for the background. I'm also I'm also being photobombed by this uh, elephant in the background. So um, you know, um, so what has been happening to me is I had to flee my home. I was working with um, a couple of whistleblowers um, in Switzerland and um, um, you know, and then in Germany. And I've been in contact with them with very many people. And um, eventually, the attacks on me became so severe and so awful. I had a journalist with me in my home who is willing to report um, about my situation. And in the end, even he heard um, a pulsed energy projectile just bounce off the ceiling lamp. And he said, what the hell was that? And I said, well, yeah, that was a shot. Um, you know, for once it didn't hit me, it actually hit um, a metal fitting. So um, after that, I, I fled my flat and I'm now in hiding. I mean, of course, the intelligence agencies followed me all the way and they know my IP address and everything, but at least where I'm now, I'm not being shot into with pulsed energy projectiles as I'm you know, saying this. I don't have to sit in a bunker. Um, but one of the things I can tell you is that um, traveling around um, and talking to many, many people, I was shocked to discover that virtually every single whistleblower activist I met has been attacked with directed energy weapons. And much more than that, talking to people and uh, raising awareness about these weapons, they keep telling me many, many incidences that are a clear indication that actually uh, both Germany and Switzerland have, and, and also the UK, have a big, broad program run by the intelligence agencies where they're now just killing people all out. 
they are killing people, they are killing activists. Um, there was um, a lawyer, a human rights lawyer supporting activists um, called um, Saschenbrecher, and he was murdered. Um, he, his car, imagine, ran full speed into a parked car. Uh, yeah. So, but it, as he was uh, running a court case, so, you know, this guy was murdered as far as I can make out. Then there are cases whereby, that's something I just heard yesterday, somebody very important, um, he, you know, he just fell down in his bedroom and then he was taken to the hospital because of, you know, injuries from this fall. And then whilst he was in the hospital, uh, his guts burst spontaneously. Yeah, like that happens um, in hospital. So it looks very much like they are killing people in hospital. And um, there was many incidences. So I've now talked to several people, um, you know, three in total, um, where they um, they used to take drugs, um, and then suddenly they started having uh, symptoms, which they described in great detail to me, um, which sounded totally one-to-one -one like synthetic telepathy and um, chips on their scalp and, and in their brains and their body. And, um, you know, they are not being believed because they used to take drugs years ago. And um, it very much seems to me that what I'm actually looking at is um, a huge program that the intelligence agencies ran for, you know, at certainly the last 20 years, whereby they started, um, you know, ramping up this program using people who used to take drugs uh, for plausible deniability. And one of the first things I have to say is that just as if you're using drugs for, you know, um, regular medication, Drugs have got a certain effect, a very specific effect, you know, just like if you're taking, for example, normal medication that the doctor prescribes, you can't just, it, it will not just have any old, um, you know, symptoms. It has very specific sim symptoms because it's a very specific chemical. And that's exactly the same with drugs. You know, you can't just blame any old thing on drugs because um, it will have very, um, you know, very clear symptoms if you're overdosing or if you're taking drugs, you know. So you can't just say, oh, just because you've got, you know, five years ago you took cocaine, now if you're, you're complaining about weird pains, you know, switching from one side of your body to the other, you know, within a second, and, and weird, uh, weird symptoms whereby you feel that your, your thoughts are being forced, that that can be blamed on cocaine five years ago, you know, no, it can't. Um, I think what's actually happening is that because people took drugs, at some point, the intelligence agencies, um, pulled them into this human experimentation program. And another thing that people need to know and, and wake up to is that uh, as far as I can make out, it is absolutely impossible to have uh, such a scale of, uh, you know, of, uh, of, of, of a drug trade in a, in a Western country without the intelligence agencies knowing about it. And by now, I would say the only reason why we still have, you know, so much uh, drug trafficking um, and human trafficking in countries is because the intelligence agencies have been running it, you know, all along. So imagine if you have, if you agree with this sort of view and you think, okay, it's fair enough, it really looks like the intelligence agencies are running the drug trade, you know, uh, there have been books written about the CIA running the drug trade in the US. Um, well, if they run the drug trade, they know their customers, right? So they can just take their customers and recruit them into the human experimentation program. And I think this is what's happening. So I just would like to draw people's attention to the fact that just because you might have taken drugs in the past doesn't mean that you can't complain about being the, the, a victim of the intelligence agencies. In fact, it makes you so much more likely that you would become a victim of the intelligence agencies. So anyway, I just this is the report here from Europe. I, I have to say it was extremely shocking to meet so many people and um, hear about random, completely unexplained heart attacks that were timed with campaigning and, and many, many other things. And um, I have to say, I'm, I'm very shocked. And um, I think we I've said this many times, but now I have actual, you know, uh, an abundance of evidence saying that we're at the heart of, a, of an active shooting war and the intelligence agencies are running an active Holocaust and they are in a phase where just killing all and sundry. Anybody who you know steps into their past, they will try to kill. And this is our very own intelligence agencies. So it's and that just, much more urgent. 
I just wanted to say on the subject of activists, Catherine, that, you know, you've just found out that European activists are being hit in this fashion. And so, in a sense, they're attesting to the reality of these electromagnetic weapon assaults. Um, that's sort of this, pretty much the same case over here in the U.S. as well. I don't know enough about it, but I have spoken to some chemtrail activists and some 9-11 truth movement activists who have both assured me of the exact same phenomenon, that activists, oh, and also Occupy activists, both here and and around the world uh, the occupy movement activists um, they are also aware of electromagnetic weapons assaults in fact in, they're they're uh, reporting it but a lot of them aren't um, speaking openly about it because they've been hit so badly you know so activists know um, journalists as we know know but they're just not writing about it other journalists that is the mainstream media ones Yes, that's that's absolutely true, and um, this is why I'm so pleased that I found, um, you know, I, I found the journalist, and I found other people um, who are um, connected to government, not to to very high up government, but um, you know, I I, I told them um, some details, and it seems like they're even personally affected. So I have found cases where there's reason to believe that government officials have been pulled into this program as well, and their their families have been devastated. Um, and, and this is the moment when you explain to them that all their troubles, you know, all these years were actually due to this program. That's when people really wake up. And uh, I was so pleased because last night a guy said to me, um, I told him about this and later we met up later this very same day when he had time to digest what I said to him. And he said to me, uh, you know, uh, I, I now understand. And, um, you know, if uh, I, I'm, I'm willing to be, re to be recruited. So if you need any help, you can count on me. And that was just, you know, basically waking somebody up within less than a day. And um, that was one of these wow moments, you know. Um, so, yes, I think it's very, uh, sorry. That's brilliant. No, it's fantastic. Yeah, yeah it's, uh, you know, it's, so these things keep happening and they are happening uh, more and more as more and more people find out. Um, but one of the things I um, I also would like to announce, so sorry to, uh, to plug my... Um, on site right now, but I just would like to announce something that I started to to do because I've got a, a court case to um, to fund. Um, I have now launched. Um, I have set up on Patreon, and um, so Patreon is a place where um, you can um, actually donate and support um, somebody um, with regular payments. So so far, I took PayPal donations, and that's what I use to find um, fund my measuring devices and my travel. But because I've got the court case to fund, I will now start posting my material and investigative reports on here. And you can become click here and become a patron. And then you can choose, you know, you can just donate one dollar per month, um, you know, whatever you like. And I'll put a lot of public um, info out on here as well. But um, because I've got a court case to run, I'm trying to incentivize people to help me raise money. So if you can raise ten dollars per month, you know, you can you can um, buy a subscription of you. Um, can raise $20 per month for me so that I can continue my work, then you have access to all these reports. And I've just posted, um, just uh, you know, just now, um, a new um, a new analysis where I am, you know, trying to to show people cartel signaling um, in in adverts and um, very important messages actually being broadcast to all of us. But I, I made this basically instead of posting it on YouTube, I have now. Um, you know, locked it up here um, so that people actually help me with the fundraising. And I also would like to say that I will be putting out everything you need for court cases will be for free. However, instruction videos I will put out um, under the subscription of $50 per month. But just think about it that um, this way, I'm trying to save you a lot of legal costs. And most lawyers take much more than just $50 per hour. So um, if you just, you know, could help me fund... Um, crowdfund $50 per month, I think that's not too much um, to ask. And then, of course, you can, you can, if you can, you know, crowdfund $100 per month, you can also um, uh, talk to me directly over, over Google Hangouts and I can advise you with your case, you know, to the best of my knowledge. So anyway, I just wanted to, unfortunately, I have to plug this. Um, but I'm also, what I'm trying to say is um, I also encourage absolutely everybody to imitate me, to get on Patreon, you know, to, to um, start calling in um, for donations because I think all of us are doing very, very important public interest work. And I don't think it's, um, you know, too harsh to ask our friends, family and people who are interested 
to actually support us because any money that they invest in victims, not just in me, all the victims who are doing um, crowdfunding, they are also investing into the future of their children, you know. So I'm, um, on one hand, I'm asking for donations, but on the other hand, I'm also asking um, people to absolutely imitate me and try these modern platforms and try to do crowdfunding and so on and so on. Because and I, I think we all need money. I should say, I should say, you know, for Catherine, really, that's a brilliant thing that you've done, Catherine, but you kind of beat me to it because I'm still working on my Patreon page. Um, I do plan to put up uh, Romolo D reports on Patreon as well. I'm just sort of working on it currently. Um, I do think that each one of us on the team should have our own Patreon page because each one of us is doing kind of work in a different area of this, uh, you know, public interest ad advocacy that we're engaging in. And, um, you know, it's just a way to involve uh, people as well and to, to bring people in to, to sort of create a community as well and to to let people know that you're not really working off on a limb by yourself for yourself you know obviously each one of us has has all has had a different life prior to this moment when we've come together and we've decided to work on this cause um, so we might very well be working on those things but we can't right now because we're so focused on trying to bring justice to the situation so in that in that uh, in that process bringing other people in I think is um, you know one of our goals as well because we want to be connected and we want to to stay relevant because we don't want to kind of hang off on a cliff by ourselves doing our own thing in this space you know we're really doing it for all of us so it's also a way to, to build community yes I, I agree and also um, I think people should um, realize actually a lot of people do realize how much um, work and also how much creative work um, goes into doing um, what we're doing and what all the many other people are doing out on YouTube. And I really feel that, um, you know, because we all have also court cases to fund, um, I don't think it's a bad thing if people, instead of just posting stuff free on YouTube, maybe post some stuff for free to actually raise their profile, but also incentivize others to, to contribute financially, you know? Because I think every, um, all the money that we, um, you know, we give to people, first of all, it's just making YouTube videos is creative work, right? So they should be entitled to um, patronage and also for, um, to payment because it's a service that they, they are offering and they are offering their creativity up for com consumption. But also, you know, they, they are also doing a public service. And um, all of us, we are paying taxes and we're paying so much money, but also most of us have got at least, you know, we, we, we still have some consumption left. You know, we, we still go out and maybe we, uh, we buy a coffee when we're traveling or we're doing this and that. And um, I think we all should think about every, all the money that we spend as investment. And you can invest it either into a coffee to keep you, you know, awake as you're traveling or you're, you're saving up that money and you're investing it into some sort of work that um, is, is helping to repair society or really inform people. So I really encourage everybody to, to imitate me and, and, and do this. Well, thanks, Catherine. Karen, I know a lot, lot's been going on at your end lately, and I don't know to what extent you want to talk about it, but... Um... Perhaps we can talk about some aspects of what's going on. OK. okay. Um, I've been telling people, I said, I, you know, I'm now involved in two legal matters. One of them was the appeal to the NSA decision to fire me in 2010. And uh, that was accepted by the EEOC despite NSA's best efforts to sabotage my EEO complaint. Uh, the judge luckily saw through it and said, OK, we're going to accept the the case. Unfortunately, it sat there on the shelf for years. I mean, from 2010 until maybe two or three weeks ago. And so the timing of the judge going and getting the case and dragging it off the shelf and looking at it and then me starting to incur lawyer fees for my EEOC lawyer answering his questions was, of course, horrible. And uh, I had a retainer that I'd given this particular law firm and it got used up, basically, reporting all of the horrible things NSA was doing to me in Tallahassee, Florida. So I'm having to start from scratch. And Catherine suggested that I ask people for help. Well, that's, that's kind of difficult for me to do. I really hate to do that because I know some people are just, you know, they just don't even get to the end of the month with any money. They may spend the last week or even two of the month wondering how they're going to eat. So that's, that's very difficult for me to do. 
but I did, and um, people have been wonderful. And I will tell you that in trying to build back up the retainer, a full third of what I sent to the lawyer this month was donations. So I have to tell people I am so appreciative of it. Um, one lady even made me cry. She went. She's in Great Britain, and she went to the trouble of finding somebody with a $5 bill that was an American bill and sent it to me in the mail. And I just tears welled in my eyes, you know, when I opened that up and she said, basically, or he said, best wishes from, from the UK. And I thought, this is just, you know, just touched my heart so much. Um, I am hoping that if uh, the EOC, if the judge is decent, if he is honest, and there are some that are, because um, I had talked to an EEOC judge that had said, if you were before me with this case, she said, I would have ruled against NSA immediately. I would have sanctioned them. So that was unfortunate. <laughs> but uh, this judge, I'm hoping maybe he's just a little slower and wants to be much more careful or something like that. So we'll have to cross our fingers and see if he rules in my favor or not. Uh, and then I'm crossing my fingers that can actually get all the money to the lawyer that she needs or the case will be dropped, you know, without the money or I'll have to pick it up myself. But um, so that's what's going on with the EEOC case. And uh, the second case, unfortunately, that I, I'm dealing with is what a lot of people have told me about has happened to them is the typical setup. Um, I had a neighbor that lived in back of my parents' home in Florida, and I'd been going down to uh, Florida for you know, four or five years for about seven months a year I mean, uh, to help them out. And just to get away from Maryland, because I was so ticked off at the Columbia, Maryland parasites in my neighborhood who had taken NSA's word and um, gang stalked me as if I had done something wrong. Uh, even after I'd been in the neighborhood for a couple decades and I had no problems with anybody. So suddenly these people are turning on me and I think for money more than anything else. So I was going down to Florida to get away from people. I felt I really wanted to slap <laughs> when I saw them. So, um, and then of course, I think I've said this before, my EEOC lawyer um, sent out a, a subpoena to get information that NSA was not pleased about in early 2015. And at that point in time, um, NSA sent representatives down to Tallahassee to tell the Fusion Center that I'm some kind of terrible person. I must have been put on the watch list or something. And they had, the Fusion Center had their InfraGuard vigilante stalk and harass me. And that lasted from um, early 2015, which is also the time that I got a Freedom of Information Act response from the Department of Justice saying, no, we don't have any adverse information about you. There's no action against you. So at exactly the same time, the Department of Justice is telling me they have no problem with me. NSA has the Tallahassee Fusion Center stalking and harassing me. So that was very interesting timing. And uh, anyway, they stalked and harassed me for several months into late November 2015, when a Twitter exchange between, between myself and apparently Bill Black Jr. Uh, became hostile because I dared to talk about 9-11. And uh, about three days later, the house that I was living in with my parents was hit with a uh, directed energy weapon attack that screwed up the refrigerator, the microwave, and the dishwasher. And so we had these electrical problems out of the blue. And I felt the burning and the... And, you know, it was, I'd never felt something like that quite before, not that strong. And uh, it was to the point that my parents had a master electrician come out to examine the house. He said, no, there's nothing wrong. And uh, so at that point in time, basically, they, uh, NSA was having people go into the woods in Florida and take these devices and shoot the house with them from dark until dawn. And then I would see people run out of the woods, jump in a car and drive away. And they were carrying some kind of black box or some kind of container. So I knew it was them. Um, so at that 
th that lasted a few weeks until they infiltrated the Greenwood Hills area of Tallahassee by telling these people, oh, she's some kind of terrorist. We need you to aim these devices at her. So that was going on from late November um, for several months. And I, of course, was trying to get the FBI to do something because that's their purview. And as soon as I would call up the Tallahassee FBI, and say, this is Karen Stewart, I'm a retired um, intelligence analyst with the National Security Agency, they'd hang up on me. I think maybe those credentials would get their attention, but it made them hang up on me. As if somebody had said, if this person calls, you're not to help her. So I tried several times and was rebuffed, basically hung up on. And um, also tried to send letters to the uh, Miami FBI and the Jacksonville FBI and the FBI headquarters in Washington with return receipts. And um, I never got the return receipts and I never got a response. So those were intercepted. And I noticed that the mail that I was getting there suddenly became tampered with after I saw somebody with Maryland license tags go into the post office that I use, and thank God for this coincidence, because I actually have his uh, license tag and car on a photograph. And I saw him asking for the, um, the postmaster of that post office. And thereafter, my mail was being stolen or being opened and, uh, or coming late. So, you know, one in one, I'm sorry, it does make two. And uh, I had somebody run the license plate and they said, oh, it's a protected license plate. We can't tell you who owns the car. So that's a high indication that it's a government car. But anyway, so that nonsense continued. And um, by October or so, I decided, well, I'm getting out of here. Um, my mother had taken two falls and so I was... Uh, forced to stay in Tallahassee, Florida for longer than I would have because of the attacks, but she'd taken two falls. She was in her mid to late 80s, and I had to stay to make sure she got the ability to walk and function back again because she really is the main caretaker for my, my father who has some dementia, but he prefers her to anybody else, and he listens to her as, uh, well, he doesn't listen to anybody else, so it was important that she got back on her feet. And she did. And by October 2016, I said, well, I'm going to be leaving because the sheriff's department is impossible. The FBI is complicit. The fusion center is absolutely complicit. And um, the people I've spoken with are, they're just impossible to talk to. The, the responses I got from gang stalkers was uh, sociopathic at best. So I said, well, I'm going to take my stuff. I'm going to divide it in the parking lot. I mean, in the, in the driveway and I'm going to divide it into to store, to take to a unit to store and to put in the car to take with me on the trip. And, uh, this particular day, um, the neighbor from behind, uh, decided to come down and, uh, try to attack me. Well, he had rung the doorbell as I was going back, back and forth between the car and uh, the house and went and hid in his car and it was behind a bush and um, I went outside didn't see anybody so I continued to my car to put stuff in it when he jumped out of his car rushed me and uh, tried to attack me well he did attack me and he threw the first punch but he missed which I'm thinking I wonder if he was high on whatever it was he usually smokes in his car so at that point in time when he was throwing the punch, I took the flashlight and I hit to block the punch, but he followed so far through that I actually ended up hitting him in the head because I was higher on the driveway than he was. And then he came back with his right and split my lip. So there was blood everywhere. And so I hit him, um, I believe another time or two and stunned him and I you know, waited to see if I could basically get back to the house safely or if he was going to leave and he proceeded to come at me again and uh, I decided well I don't want to get in a I don't want to get into close quarter fighting with this guy so I said maybe if I damage his car he'll go away so I did that and uh, 
he essentially didn't like his car getting damaged, so he drove off. And uh, he called the sheriff's department. I called the sheriff's department. And uh, they came out, and the deputies told me they, were, they had been sent out to arrest him. And then a uh, supervisor rushed out to tell them, no, they weren't arresting Renee's son, which was the neighbor behind us. And she had worked for the sheriff's department for 24 years. And uh, what they were doing was that they were dismissing and ignoring several months of my telling them that he was part of the harassment, how he was using the directed energy weapon, why I thought he had one, the evidence that I had, which were meter readings. And they totally dismissed all that. And uh, I heard the supervisor tell the female deputy who had spoken to me and spoken to my mother, who was a witness, um, that we're going to dis discount all that. And we're just going to say that um, this man came over for a nice, friendly neighborhood visit, and you just attacked him for nothing. So at that point in time, I got thrown in jail. And um, they released me after a day and then came and got me again the next day and, and arrested me again. I said, what in the world are you arresting me for now? And they said, well, we found a trail camera on your property, and we're going to say you were cyber-stalking the family. And a trail camera, you can't cyber stalk anybody with a trail camera. It's uh, something that, that was put up to find out or to get evidence um, regarding the person who was climbing the fence between this man's family property and our family property every single night and damaging the fence. So it was put out as a security uh, camera. So they said, oh, that's cyber stalking when it's not. You can't connect to the internet, and um, it only takes pictures of motion. Hunters basically use it to figure out if there are, there's game in a certain part of the woods, and it's only motion triggered. So you cannot possibly view anything real time, and you can't cyber stalk with it. So that was a yet another calculated lie, and that ended uh, ended up putting me in jail for about, I think, four or five days, maybe six, and. Uh, the lawyer my husband retained because I had no chance to find one in one day, uh, got me out and she basically struck a deal. She said, how about Karen goes back to Maryland to be with her husband? Because otherwise they wanted me actually to wear an ankle bracelet for the numerous months that it takes to actually arrange a trial. And, and I, I thought, should, so I I'm so dangerous. <laughs> Yeah, it's outrageous. You know, Karen, we should really point out at this point that um, did did this man's mother tell you this about um, how they, the sheriff's department couldn't touch him but was going to come after you? Uh, two weeks before the man attacked me, and he's in his 30s, and he had no job that anybody could find, and uh, he has a long history of substance abuse and battery, as where... As you can imagine, a six-year-old woman who worked for the National Security Agency has a clean slate, no, no criminal record, for Pete's sake, you know. But um, what had happened two weeks before the attack was that his sister, who also worked for the Sheriff's Department, had driven to the house, uh, come up and asked for me, and I said, yes, you know, this is me. And she said, I am so-and-so. I'm, you know, this guy's sister. And he said, and she said, we are, you know, the sheriff's department is a family. He, she said, he can do, we can basically do anything we want to you and get away with it. So your efforts to get the sheriff's department to um, come against my brother will be futile. You know, you so see, we exchange some kind of, words. That's yeah. blockbuster. That's major. That's incredible nepotism and incredible threat and intimidation. You know, it's outrageous. It kind of tells you yep. what's really going on on the ground over there, you know? In that oh, it absolutely is. The yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So yeah, for them to demand that you wear an ankle bracelet in the face of this kind of blatant nepotism, you know? Yeah. It's an absolute because, joke. Yeah, because I'm so dangerous that I would actually defend myself against somebody who is attacking me at the time, you know? And they said, oh, the flashlight you used to hit him was a deadly weapon. And... I said, you know, I happen to be holding it. What am I, what am I going to do? Take off my shoe and hit him? Because I actually am petite boned. I have some extra weight, but my bone structure is petite. He's a monster, you know? And um, 
<laughs> as far as I knew, he was going to do grievous bodily injury because he came out of the car cursing me and threatening me. You know, um, gosh, I, this it, is, it's, it's outrageous. It's, it is outrageous. This, this is the Flo Florida state prides itself on having a law called the Stand Your Ground Law, which is to keep overzealous district attorneys from prosecuting people who are merely defending themselves from attackers who come onto their own property. But the assistant district attorney, um, in doing favors for the sheriff's department, totally ignored that law. Totally ignored the law. And she's just going to prosecute whoever she wants to prosecute for whatever reason. And the heck with the law. So, yeah, this is the type of insanity that I was dealing with in Tallahassee. And uh, there's a, a plea offer. She had uh, threatened to put me away for 15 years, which you can imagine if you're 60 years old and you go to prison for 15 years, that's pretty much a death sentence. You know, that's pretty much life in prison. And but she was also, bragging also, to my Karen, lawyer she could do that. This yeah. is ridiculous. Oh, yeah. Years. yeah, like literally, you know, in, in Britain, I, I've seen cases where like a guy has murdered his, his newborn child. It wasn't a newborn. It was like uh, one and a half years old. And got four years for cold, cold blooded murder, you know, and then when they get four years, they're out, you know, after two or after three or whatever, you know, I'd say it's 15 years for splitting a guy's lip even if that, on your own property. I mean, you know what, my reaction to this is, I mean, that just teaches you, Karen, you know, I said this before, you should have taken a gun and if she just like, you know, shot the guy because then you would have some, you know, the gun lobby behind you, you know, and it would be about guns. And, but it, because it just involves a flashlight, that's you know, we can't mobilize the gun. That's a great point, because actually that stand your ground law is often quoted much in relation to guns and the use of guns to defend oneself. But you're right, in the case of flashlight, I mean, you know, of course, now the flashlights become our logo, right? Oh, no, no, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> we stand up with a flashlight to defend themselves. <laughs> Yeah, women need flashlights. But, you know, the point to make also is um, you may have whacked him with a flashlight, but didn't he whack your car as well? And didn't he kind of come after you in a very threatening fashion? Oh, he jumped out of the car and his fists were like this. And this is a boxer stance for when you intend to lead with your left and then deliver the, the blow with the right, which is what he did. Now, like I said, he's coming at me. He's it's on a slant, so I'm actually standing higher, even though he's several inches taller, but I'm a little bit higher on a slant to driveway, and he hit with the left, and I thought he was going to hit me, so I came down with the flashlight, trying to hit the arm to deflect, but what he did was he turned like this, and I ended up hitting the side of his head, and then, of course, he came back with the right and punched me in the lip and s totally split it clear through. Oh, and at that point wow. in time, I hit him another couple times with the flashlight to stop the aggression, you know, and um, he was stunned and I was sitting there, you know, basically thinking, you know, do I have time to get back to the house or is he going to grab me from behind if I try? Cause I hesitated to turn my back on him. And, uh, I waited to see a couple seconds if he was going to get back in the car and leave. And he just basically started at me again. So that's when I said, all right, I'm not going to be able to beat this monster anymore. So if I damage his car, maybe he'll just take his car and go home, which is essentially what, what he did, you know? So it was a calculated a decision on my part to um, hurt the car and not the person, not to continue to beat on the person, you know, just, and I use the example of a, a sheep guarding dog because those types of dogs will use just enough pressure to stop the aggression. You know, if they see a wolf on a hill somewhere, they're not going to run and chase the wolf down and kill it. You know, mm -hmm. they're going to, they're going to go out huff and puff and, and drive the wolf away and return to the flock. So you use just enough pressure, just enough uh, force to nullify the threat mm -hmm. and let it go. And that's what I was trying to do when I deflected from hitting him again to hitting his car, you know, trying to basically 
motivate him to leave, you mm -hmm. know. And it also so, sounds like you kind of blocked his saying, first oh, blow. You blocked his first well, blow. He's the one who sort of led with his fist and he tried to whack you. And that's when, you know, you kind of lashed out with a flashlight. And instead of hitting his arm, because he was ducking, you kind of hit the back of his head. And then he hit your lip and everything. So you were right. the one who ended up in the hospital with that cut lip and needing stitches. And Well, he actually needed stitches, too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Karen finished so... him off. You know, I want them all to know. Karen hospitalized the bastard. Well so, done. so we both went and got stitches um and uh so i ended up going uh, to jail after getting the stitches but i i did laugh when a deputy told my brother who is also a hulk my brother's huge and uh she said she said to him she was you know getting his uh uh testimony from uh, him hearing and feeling the emanations from these devices and she said and she shook her head and she said you know, your sister really messed him up. And my brother <laughs> laughed. And he, he had to tell me, he said, I'm proud of you. <laughs> so, so, that so am I, I really. <laughs> and you know, this, this is a lesson to all of you Americans, you know. It's like you have to carry a gun and you have to pop some caps and some asses because if you don't, you end up in this sort of mess. You know, so I mean, literally, you either gun the, the bastard down, leave him alive if you can be bothered, and then literally, this would be all over Alex Jones. You know, the gun lobby would just would be lapping it up. You know, and then the whole defend your ground, uh, you know, jurisdiction would really kick into action. You know, Catherine. <laughs> Millicent's laughing. <laughs> She's laughing ahead of, yeah. But is that, is that so? I mean, that's the lesson I take away from this, you know? <laughs> I think Millicent's offering a word of caution. <laughs> that takes in the peaceful approach, everyone. <laughs> yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, you know, yeah, I, you can't. Without any rallying yeah. call. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. But I'm just, I'm just like you know, I, Millicent is right. She's the good cop. I'm always the bad cop. I'm always the person saying off with their heads, you know. But um, <laughs> but it's true. I mean, you have to wonder what what um because it is just so much the way that the judiciary is um you know deciding cases and how much hassle they give victims. Um, you know, it, they do send out signals, and and, um, and and actually the judiciary is aware of this because I heard the uh, um, Supreme Court lawyer, uh, judges in the UK talk about it, what what you know what sort of um, precedence does this set in a society, and what sort of in incentives you know do people receive? And I think it's a very good point because if the judges um, behave like that, and if they you know a woman gets attacked by a much younger guy on her own property. And ends up in hospital, but then ends up in jail, and he doesn't. Like, what yes, sort of yes. incentive is that? You know, I mean, if first you start to finish, and, and, that's wrong. You know, how did that guy not end up in jail? I mean, it's absurd that Karen yeah. ended up in jail for this because this was her house. You know, her parents' house. She was walking around doing something with her car, carrying boxes here and there, doing whatever on her own house and property. And this guy shows up out of nowhere and picks a fight with her, and is you know threatening and int intimidating from the get go, and he hits her. And breaks her lip and all this stuff, and he doesn't end up in jail. There's like kind of obvious injustice over there, and obvious strangeness and bizarreness. It's a perversion of law, and uh, I'm afraid that uh, Tallahassee is pretty famous for that. I mean, I've read some some incidents before, you know, like a FDLE, a Florida Department of Law Enforcement agent was uh, basically at least reprimanded for falsifying accusations against somebody. So unfortunately, Tallahassee has a uh, reputation of being really full of dirty cops and anybody else who has anything to do with their so-called justice system. You know, there was one judge who was reprimanded by the Florida Supreme Court for her false advertisements, blatantly false advertisements, when she was running for her judgeship, but she sits there as a judge still. You know what kind of what kind of judge is that? My you goodness. know, mm -hmm. and you know what? I, I think it is a it is a uh, you know a good point. And actually, we should 
we should not shy away from actually bringing this up. I mean, medicine is totally right for, you know, <laughs> bringing me back on track and not to advertise to all Americans to just gun people down on their property. <laughs> she is, she's totally we right. And I still have to live here. Yeah, exactly. You still have to live here. But then again, maybe the place would be much nicer if people. <coughs> Sorry, I'm joking. I'm joking. You know. <laughs> but, but you know what? It is. Um, I mean, just aside and staying totally within the law. You know, um, judges have to be aware that um, if the corruption reaches a level where where people are hurt on their own property by malicious um, forces and they can't defend themselves eventually we do get back to natural law whereby it is an eye for an eye you know and it is if, if a guy comes after a woman and and she is fearing for her life you know there are countries uh it's in europe where this is still accepted that she can just finish him off because he's a guy you know and uh it, it, anybody who would who would claim otherwise you know would well, what would he then uh, say? Well, a woman just has to let her, you know, be overwhelmed by a guy, and then what? You know, acquiesce to being raped and being mutilated and this sort of stuff. Well, I think there are self-defense laws in this country, aren't there, Karen? I think people can actually defend themselves, and you know, in the gun-bearing states, I think in Texas and so forth, it's you know, people do whip out their guns, and you know, they are they can make the argument in court that they um, use their guns in self-defense. Right. Mm -hmm. But from a well, domestic, again, go ahead. From a domestic violence standpoint, though, the uh, saddening, saddening to hear her say that they preferred this over her, a, a much older woman, but not just that on her own property. Which for my dissertation on domestic violence. And that's just trying to educate the church support mechanism for women and and uh, and others who have been abused. It's almost becoming an epidemic. Enforcement turns a blind eye victims of domestic violence in my hometown. Here, there was a rash of murders. Females who had been crying out for, and and I and I know we're not. This is not exactly what, but it's it's in the same area. We're talking about a man abusing a woman, taking the side of the man. In 2004, there was a medical result who was being stalked, officer, who was also ex-army. Three years for her steps to give her protection. It ended with him actually shot on, on a shoot, then shot himself. Now she was married to someone else, and and he constantly been her headline in the paper. The but we told her to get a gun quite enough, you know, taking a note, and yet she ended up dead. That, that was a man who had two children, two daughters. Um, her, when I, I contacted just, just the briefly, just, editor sorry. of the newspaper, uh, just a second, Melissa. Sorry, because your audio is being messed with, but I want everybody to actually hear this case because you're mentioning a very important case. So I'm just going to repeat what I heard on my end. So you are, um, as I understood, you're mentioning the case of a woman who was, um, she was uh, basically asking for protection for three years, right? Um, and then eventually Correct. she was attacked and then she was killed by the man that she has been begging, uh, you know, the police to protect her from. Right. I mean, that, that's something to be taken in. And that was in Tennessee as well, right? That's correct. Right here in Columbia, right here where I live. Just this. You know, we should also um, we should also make a note here, Millicent, that basically your audio is being hacked literally by the same guy who has access to a satellite and who is doing this to you and has been doing this to you, Randy Webster. 
you know, whom we've written about and whom uh, Catherine has spoken about, and both Catherine and Karen have called the FBI about multiple times and received no response from, um, that you're being incredibly cyber hacked by this one guy. And I think this needs to be published to the world and known at large because it's outrageous. This should not be happening to anybody. Nobody has a right to get into anybody else's head or into anybody else's computer. And this guy's doing both. The good thing about the, uh, the medical doctor was murdered is that obviously again, the perpetrator was ex-army, ex-police. And I learned in 2013 that many of the, when they are ex-military, because there are so many former military police forces or in law enforcement, slow to investigate each other. So that They're could have led to her death or it could have saved her life. Actually, a naval chaplain told me, he said, it's, it's, it's called fraternization. So familiar with military law. And so it just makes me wonder, someone relaying may have also been not just possibly also at former military. And it's like they've got this um, in, in the voice of that familiar person saying, for each other. That's one of the reasons why that person, this person that I've been talking, felt like he couldn't get caught. And I told her about this situation. This is our second conversation. And she said to me, because of his rank, I could play. Done about it. Domestic violence area went on record in by for big systems of domestic violence in the court system. The district attorney's office. So right. actually just very briefly, Melissa. Yeah, just a second, because I, I noticed, sorry, I'm so, I hate to interrupt you, and it makes me angry that I have to interrupt you, and I want you to say everything you just said again. I just would like to inter interject one thing here, while, while you're talking, because I can, I have now seen any form of, you know, uh, digital cyber sabotage that the intelligence agencies can come up with, and I, I also know what it sounds like when it's just a bad connection. And I can tell that your your line is being sabotaged. You are now, right now, the victim of cyber hacking. And just when I first said that, you know, you're being cyber hacked, your audio went back to normal. We could hear you for a couple of sentences and then it went back bad again. So just let me just say one thing. I would like the world to know that the, the person we're dealing with is Randall Webster. He is former US Air Force and this man, is being supported, I have to say by now, this man is being supported by the Air Force, this man is being supported by the FBI in Tennessee, by the FBI in Washington, who refuse to arrest this man, who there's reason, plenty of reason to believe, is not just committing cyber hacking, but is also a serial killer, who has murdered a lot of people in his own family and in Millicent Black's family, and he is connected. There is a signals intelligence trace going from this man straight to body chips in Dr. Millicent Black, Millicent Black's body. And this guy is also an audio communication with chips that were implanted in her ear. And because this has been going on for almost a year now, and it's been public for almost a year, I would also have to say that the NSA is supporting the serial killer the NSA is supporting him because if the NSA weren't, then this would have been solved absolutely months ago. So I want to make this absolutely clear. We are dealing with crime committed by Randall Webster, crime committed by the Air Force, which you can see now live on camera, and crime committed by the NS fucking A, who really has the capability to sort out the cyber hacking mess for everybody in the US, but doesn't. And it makes me so angry because 
basically, Millicent has done excellent research and she's standing up for women. And the NSA is not even capable to track down, to literally secure a single fucking laptop in Tennessee, right? Is it too much to ask for these utter worthless tosses with all their billions that, you know, that's being pumped into them? I mean, how freaking hard can it be for the FBI and the NSA to secure a laptop in Tennessee if they could please for next Thursday, sort the shit out. It would be great. And that would be the first step to actually stop this crime because it makes me so angry. You know, Millicent is actually one of my top investigators and she can't be heard because the NSA can't secure communication channels to their own servers from a laptop in Tennessee. How hard can it be? And I think we have to go now and literally hold them to this because they are being paid absolutely billions for national security, for cyber security, and for the freaking signals intelligence. And people just ignore that with all the victims, there is a non-stop radio communication, right? Path between the body chips and, as I now know, Lockheed Martin databases that are actually maintaining these chips. And people like Randall Webster, psychopathic serial killers have been given access to Lockheed Martin software, hardware, and the entire you know grid of hardware that goes into this, even including satellites to torture people like Millicent and hack her laptop when she's trying to help others. So I'm sorry, I'm sorry to absolutely lose it here on camera, but this is what we're dealing with. And I'm so frustrated that I called the FBI in Memphis and the FBI in Tennessee and I had to call them on each occasion three times because they hung up on me when I wanted to report this crime. So I want everybody to know that when we are all straining to hear Millicent, it is because she has super important information for us and we can't hear her because these worthless organizations can't do a simple rookie job of just sorting out a single important laptop in Tennessee. Right? That's what we're dealing with. So I think that everybody who's watching now should write the letters to, the, to Congress now and take this video as an example and say, this is the reason why the NSA funding needs to be halved. Every single week that we can't hear Millicent, the FBI and the NSA funding needs to be halved until they sort this out. Really? You know, how, how is the FBI allowed to exist, really? How is the FBI allowed to exist in Columbia, in Mount Pleasant, in Memphis, Tennessee? All of those FBI bureaus that were consulted with, that were informed, that were told. You know, an article has been published. This information is out in the World Wide Web at this point in time. You know, this is worldwide yeah. disclosure as to what's going on with Millicent. And if, if anyone has doubts about Millicent's case, go back and read that article, please, because it lays out exactly what evidence she has and how that evidence connects to frequencies from the FCC and connects to Lockheed Martin and connects to the NSA and connects to those army bases abroad you know, that are transmitting frequencies. So these connections cannot be denied. You know, this has to do, it, it's impossible to believe that the NSA, which is supposedly an intelligence agency, which works in the, in, you know, with SIGINT, right? Signals intelligence, does not have an awareness of these uh, particular frequencies that are being transmitted from specific locations. And that the FCC, which records all of those frequencies and registers all of those frequencies as related to whichever transmitting agency is involved, you you know, it's also very difficult to believe that the FCC does not have a say in this. The FCC, the NSA, and who else? The FBI on the ground, just, you know, given all of this information, does not bother to investigate. Literally, you know, this is like that, um, you know, this is like the story, Millicent, that you frequently tell us of that guy, the, the Washington sniper, right? The Mohammed guy, I forget his last name. Um, you know, um, I was in DC. At the, I was in the DC area at the time, and there were these horrific um, reports of this guy uh, rolling about town in his car with with a, with a young accomplice, just shooting randomly and killing people. And we'd hear the reports, and I know Karen probably knows exactly what I'm talking about because she's in the Washington DC area as well. Um, you know, you, so it was kind of it's astonishing. It was like holding the entire city hostage, the whole, whole area hostage, the DC metro area hostage to this uh, sniper who was going around randomly killing people. Uh, a lot of women, I understand, right? Yeah. Now we have this guy, Randy Webster, who is using <laughs> ultra high tech, extremely sophisticated neurotechnology, brain computer chips, 
you know, which are using BCI interfaces, using a computer and using a satellite. He has access to some multi-million dollar contracts. And as Catherine just very, very aptly pointed out, he clearly has the support of those people who gave him those contracts, you know, which kind of sounds like it might have been the DOD or the US Air Force, which is, I suppose, a branch of the DOD, right? Um, and who else? Who else is involved with satellites? NASA is involved with satellites? Um, is the name FBI Lockheed aware? Martin. Lockheed Martin, because they are, they've got this whole informational, uh, you know, unit where they are taking care of all of the the satellite tech and the database tech for the uh, for the US Air Force. Ramola, I have uh, purchased image of a Lockheed Martin satellite over my home on January the 18th, 2003, which was about six months before the high tech torture. Um, Yes, actually, right, right. So you have that that evidence as well of that satellite imagery. And then you have supposedly the Federal Bureau of Investigation, who, sh who if given all this data, should really step forward to investigate, but they don't investigate. So you have to wonder how complicit are they? And you know, if and we know, extremely, right? <laughs> and, and we know from, from Ellison's story that, I mean, her entire town, in a sense, was kind of apprised of this thing that was going on with Millicent, that she was going to be the subject of an investigation. She was going to be the subject of an experiment. And they were told, you know, experiment, massive yeah. series of lies about, oh, you can do anything to her. You know, who's running this experiment? Is it the CIA running this experiment? Is it the CIA or the NSA or both together? Ramola, I, I want to I want to put the the attention back on on Karen. Experiment is about to cost me twelve inches of the bone out of my right leg. Place there so that I could be tortured, trying to not talk, talk about it in this town because people need to understand. See that the leg with the bar across the back is uh, that's the area of the twelve inches of bone that's going to have to be amputated out of my leg. Oh, dear God. Notice all of those dots. Whenever I sit, energy is directed to those, those dots. And is damaged. Except the times when he just lays, locks on is what the term is. When he locks on to those, those implants, then that radiation goes to my bone. He keeps saying and he's I giving me bone. Out. I should point out that those implants, that there is evidence of their existence. So anybody watching this, please don't imagine that this is, these are the ravings of somebody delusional. This is absolute fact. Millicent has factual scientific evidence of those implants being in her body and transmitting at certain frequencies. Yeah. In fact, the image that she's showing is from, from a specialist who's making measurements of body implants in the U.S. She is the leading expert in the world and people flock to her from around the world. And then she has scanned other people as well, you know, and um, I have seen scans of other people and, and, and they are true because we keep finding the chips in the very same locations. And um, this is what people have to understand. These body chips to me seem to, they can cause local pain, but I also suspect that they are beacon signals where, you know, uh, Nazi companies like Lockheed Martin and many, many others and the criminal psychopathic serial killers who they employ can train the weapons and these weapons can pick out these implants and then basically just shoot at your body part, you know? And I think this is what's happening. And, um, and, and then computers do the pattern recognition, the steering. And um, I have re heard reports now from every part of the world where people you know, send me videos and they, they measure these implants that they have sometimes on their head. And then they report about being shot in the head from a driving car behind them or in front of them that has these weapons. And, and it's, it's just absolutely awful. And I want the entire world to know that Millicent had to uh, shift vital surgery that she needs because this psychopathic serial killer, Randall Webster, continues assaulting her, and she's we she is not well enough for this operation. And this is after we have notified the FBI, absolutely, like almost a year ago, and they are incapable. So I want people to know that the, the people well, who are actually, running FBI, sorry. In 2013, US Representative Mike Turner from Ohio at the FBI, I had 
too short. Um, so they have also been contacted since I've been back in Tennessee. Before I came back, back to Tennessee, because I actually mailed them one their information so that they could see what was happening. I have contacted them with no response. But Karen was, was talking about, because Karen, in PSYOP, they tell you what they're going to do to you. They do it and say, we told you we were going to do it. Describe to us. I also wanted to mention, you know, to just follow <laughs> up on what Catherine said about those implants, you know, that um, there are respond transponders, sorry, that are uh, part of these implant systems, apparently, which really do nothing but receive a certain radio signal and then they transmit a different radio signal. And where are they transmitting this radio signal? They're transmitting it into the organ or the joint or the body part in which they are enmeshed. And that's how they're destroying the organ of the joint. And that is exactly what Millicent is describing. Yeah, exactly. And and, and also the other thing I want people to know, and, um, you know, I, I, uh, I, I keep being contacted by victims from all around the world, and absolutely everybody um, is, is saying the same thing. I have now received, um, you know, I have counseled somebody from North America, and I've counseled people from, from India, from, from Europe, absolutely everywhere. And um, basically, what the intelligence agencies are running, they have implanted these beacon signals into people. They are shooting at them. They're training up a decentralized instant kill system against the civilian populations. And they are using mostly women to torture them to death. OK, why women? Because there's a massive sexual element. And basically, the intelligence agencies and the militaries are trying to get their psychopathic degenerate nutters like Randall Webster addicted to killing and mutilating women. All right, we have reached an utter degeneracy in our intelligence agencies in the US and in Europe and in other parts of the world where these psychopathic nutters are basically uh, arousing themselves on killing their own population, their own women. This is how fucking degenerate these men are. This is our own military leaders. So if you see a fucking NATO general mug or the head of MI6 or the head of the CIA or the NSA, just know that they are running a program to get their own serial killing psychopaths addicted to killing their own population. I mean, what, how fucking degenerate can these people be? I'm sorry about the swearing because you all deserve so much better, but you have to understand that this is what we're dealing with. So when Millicent is coming on the show, you have to understand how hard it is for her to just come on the show every week because she's being tortured. She, she hasn't slept last night, like any other night, because her brain is being accessed, what, 64 times per, per hour or something like that? She has the sleep studies. And this is all being done by literally an Air Force veteran and his gang of thugs. And the NSA that we know from, not just from Bill Binney and Kirk Weed, but there's an entire film called The Good American about how much money the NSA got for their stupid programs. They have absolutely billions and billions, and they're not capable of securing their own country. They can access every single freaking laptop in the, in the entire USA and everywhere in the world, and they can't secure Millicent's laptop, and they can't track down this criminal who lives exactly a mile and a half from her, right? So what's Actually, going on? The National Network to End Domestic Violence safety net program told me first of all to department that they would train them in how to cyber crime got that invitation in when I lived in Mount Pleasant and I've had it since when I was investigated from the Columbia Police Department and apparently neither of them have taken them up on their offer. So the next time I contacted the National Network to End Domestic Violence, said, tell your police department, crime unit to your home. So the cyber crime unit. Talk to me, the cyber crime unit. I said, but the domestic violence that you do, his name is Lieutenant Joy Gideon, the investigator that was a, uh, a um, investigate my case. 
just short of getting my phone records from AT&T, just short of getting records from Yahoo that would have pointed the finger at the person that we've been talking about. Just short of our car computer was being hacked also endangering the life of my mother as I drove her to a, a doctor's appointment. Just disappear. You know, they're so keen to Baker Act anybody, but this person, if they did an equivalent Baker Act on him, how could he possibly pass? How, if they, and I've told them that, you know, uh, Captain Potts of the police department near you, I've said, you know, just Baker Act him or whatever the equivalent is for Tennessee, he'll never come out again. But no, they can't Baker Act a crazy person. They're, they specialize in Baker Acting um, normal people. So that's very frustrating. Yeah, that's and very I, frustrating. And, and I think we need to understand what's going on here because what that means is that they want us dead. They want, they want to kill down women. And this is part of the entire depopulation agenda. They, if you kill the women and if you kill the children, you're, you're seriously damaging an entire nation. And, it's, this, and why depopulation? Depopulation is not because these psychopaths want to save the planet. I mean, don't get them wrong, right? This is to weaken the entire USA to asset strip it because ultimately they're after the billionaires, they're the people with after the people with a lot of money in Europe and in the US. And in the US these these are the billionaires and in Europe these are the royal families. And um, what you have to realize is that what you're watching now live is the murder and mutilation of women. And we talked about children at the last episode by our own so-called intelligence agencies and by our own militaries. Right. I mean, it, this is a, a level of degeneracy that that previous armies in previous centuries haven't reached. Right. So literally medieval armies, if you had a medieval army turn on their own town, uh, is there an example of this? I would love to hear that from historians that you have, you know, a town's military installations turn on their own people and it should just start killing their own women inside the, the city walls. Has that ever happened? But, but now we're literally at the stage where you know, our our civil um, our, our military installations and military organizations are indeed captured by organized crime. These to these people are totally degenerate, and they are killing their own. Yes, well, I think it's not that's not historical precedent, actually, Catherine, because you know the military and the CIA have indeed done terrible things to whole towns. Actually, you know the LSD experiments, and then there's radiation experiments, etc. And right now, I think literally for the past. 40 to 50 years, people have been reporting that in the vicinity of military bases, people report all sorts of strange, you know, ailments and diseases and symptoms and so forth. And so there is there some kind of recorded history of, you know, very unethical, illegitimate military experiments on this on civilian populations. What's happening now to now though is as you say exacerbated. It's on a, it's a, it's on an astronomically different scale, you know, because now they have access to stealth weaponry of various kinds. Yeah. Whether it's chemical, biological, or um, you know, physical, electromagnetic. Yeah. Absolutely, yes, and, and you're right. I mean, there are plenty of examples of this in the 20th century. Um, but I was literally I was trying to look into the history of you know warfare, and and I want people to understand how utterly degenerate the situation is. You know, and um, and and what people need to understand in every single country. I mean. I, when I'm being attacked in the UK, I'm being attacked by MI5. When British people are being attacked in the UK, they are being attacked by MI5. This isn't Mossad people, this is MI5. When you're in Germany, you're being attacked by the BND and the so-called Verfassungsschutz, which is this, you know, I would now say Nazi organization. Um, and when you're in Switzerland, you're being attacked by Swiss intelligence, you know, and, and that's how it works. You're being attacked by Swiss people killing their own. Um, and, and, you know, we should say that Millicent's case is actually a flagship case in this country. Ordinary. It's absolutely extraordinary. It's unique. Because through her case, we get to know of stuff that's been happening all around her. You know, to her family, to her extended family, to her entire town. Because she's gotten disclosure from so many people in the town. And, you know, I'm going to continue following this case. And I'm going to continue reporting 
reporting on it. So much here that needs to be dug up and reported. And, um, you know, the, the real reporters out there might want to really look into Millicent's case because there's a wealth of information here as to what's really going on and does need to be explored and reported because once again we are dealing with you know it's kind of a replay of mk ultra where you have a very covert operations going on destined operations using very highly sophisticated technologies that are being um directed at various people in the town so many women that a millicent has been to have have given her information to suggest that Many other women have been assaulted on a consistent basis and many other women have lost their lives, you know, and children are also being assaulted mm -hmm. by this one man with access to this deadly technology. I can't prove that it is by this one man. One of the things that I was told in 2003 in the early days of me being sure when the high tech talk we're going to turn your family into assassins. I mean, that my family was not just my biological family, family, family. So you see that, that exactly is correct. And the MK Ultra going on in this, this town. Yeah, I, I think it has to be said that in, in this case, uh, we do. Uh, and I, we're talking about of innocent people. you say? Oh, oh, sorry, sorry. In, because my audio was delayed, Catherine? I didn't actually mean. I didn't mean to interrupt you. I um, I um, sorry. I, I didn't realize that you were you were still talking. I, I think, I think in in this case, you know, we can say that it's um him very likely because um there was a time when he was actively stalking you, and in a way that showed that he was directly involved with this. You know, he made hints and so on. And you already got a temporary um, you know, uh, um, what's it called, restriction order. Rest Restraining. Yeah, um, yeah. A, a restraining order, exactly, against this guy. And, um, you know, the, the, the pattern of assault has been identical. So I think it's fair to, to assume, you know, it's, it's actually totally valid to assume that he's still involved. And, um, you know, he still keeps uh, sending audio transmissions, which in principle can also be, you know, done with computer voice morphing. But, but given that you have this history where he validated that it's really him by stalking you and being utterly weird and, you know, saying a lot of right. things. You know, I, I am totally confident to say that, that it is this man. And I, you know, I think it stands up in any quarter of the world, given the evidence you have. And um, I just, um, I mean, people need to understand, first of all, I mean, first of all, they need to understand what it really implies. The fact that they can, they can watch, you know, today we summarized the case of, of Karen, we summarized the case of Millicent. And um, people have to understand what it actually implies. Um, for the, you know, for their own militaries and for the uh, their own intelligence agencies that these cases are even allowed to to happen, you know, and but very quickly you realize that this wouldn't be allowed to happen unless the uh, intelligence agencies actively condone or even actively supported by, uh, you know, giving out the equipment. So it's it's fair to assume that Lockheed Martin is involved, um, you know, and is condoning this, actively doing this. Um, the NSA is involved, actively doing that. The FBI is also actively doing it. And um, once you see that the FBI and the NSA and all the others are actively um, mutilating people to death in their own home and are training people up in large numbers to do the same thing, um, you know, what you have is a situation of high treason. So these people are working for a foreign power. They, they, are, are. they are killing Americans for they foreign are. power. They are working for a foreign power, and but they're working locally, you know. All of these agencies are working through these fusion centers. And they're working through local law enforcement. Through these means, they're able to enter neighborhoods and communities and lie to people. You know, they lie to people. This is all about scapegoating of targets. This is about the creation of false targets. Well, first of all, the word target is absolutely execrable. But, you know, the creation of targets, the creation of false um, suspects. Yeah, because this is what they're doing. They're telling people that this person is suspected of being involved in some kind of terrorist operation or pedophilic operation or child abuse, projecting their own crimes onto us, right? They, so they, they, they crawl whole communities around these people who become scapegoats. And how else could that happen unless the local law enforcement fully condoned it, 
local fusion centers fully condoned it so that when targets speak out and go to police stations and go to fusion centers and tell them what's going on, well, nothing happens. Nothing happens. Nothing happens because they are complicit, because they are part of, it, part of this. They are doing this. Well, let me interject very briefly again that when I went to the duty officer at the Leon County Sheriff's Department to yet again uh, ask for help and explain to him what was going on, he said, just a moment, and he walked out to his car. He opened the trunk, and I followed him out there. He had a bundle of about, I don't know, between, well, probably closer to 20 files, and he said, what was your name? And I gave him my name. And he looked through the bundle of files in his car trunk, found one, pulled it out, looked at it and said, nope, can't help you. Sorry. Put it back in the bundle, put it into the trunk of his car and went back to his desk. Now, See, that's very interesting evidence. Yeah. And you can't subpoena files that are in somebody's trunk, right? And if you do a Florida Sunshine Act request, which is the, the equivalent of a FOIA, they'll just say, oh, we have no files in the building concerning that. So they're taking targeted individuals and putting files on them in the trunks of cars oh. and keeping them there. Oh, my. That is huge, actually, yeah. Karen. I think we should publish yeah. that of information. Yeah. Yeah, I didn't Karen know that mentioned it before, but only now that I twig it when you mentioned the uh the exactly the requesting of information. I didn't twig this before. I didn't realize this thing about the buildings either. I didn't know that there was some kind well, of law. That... No, I'm just I'm specifying that when you ask for a uh, Florida Sunshine Act, I want to know everything you have on me. That you expect them to have the files in the building of the entity that you're requesting the information right. from. Right. None, of us, none of us go to the Department of Justice with a FOIA and say, what do you have on me? And could you please check everybody's car trunk too? <laughs> right. Exactly. What do you have on me on your yeah. trunk? But exactly. that, would suggest, that would suggest a kind of an extrajudicial listing that's being carried about privately. Yeah. Yes. On the opposite. It's a legal blacklist. It's a Last term in Congress, Dennis Kucinich from Ohio, his last term in Congress, he actually wrote a bill against extrajudicial killing. He knows what's going on. Yeah. Yeah, yeah he was trying to uh, basically stand against Star Wars because he knew exactly what it was. It wasn't defending us against missiles. It was basically killing scapegoats, you know, for the military industrial complex to Basically, we're cannibalizing our young. We're basically taking our own citizens and killing them for sport and for profit. Mm -hmm. And it is, as Catherine said, connected to this eugenics program because, you know, it's the best and the brightest. The, the people of, you know, the most upstanding in communities, the most outspoken. The other ones were being targeted. Activists are being targeted. Absolutely. And I think Karen, when I hear this, oh, sorry. Well, I was just going to confirm what Karen said. I was told I was a lab rat, a guinea pig, for entertainment and sensationalism. The boys have new toys better than the catch. And I do have all that documented. Mm -hmm. Three, 14 years ago. Goodness, and now right. we see what the, the, the results of their hunting. And you know, in a sense, about to come off my leg. And in a sense, Millicent, all of this goes back to what we were talking about last week, actually. You know, where we were talking about secret societies, running these secret societies, having immense power, no brains nothing to do with their time, but to go around hunting and killing people and engaging in weird mystery religions from, you know, 3,000 years ago and believing in child sacrifice, this, that, and the other, and um, also involving women in this, in this uh, space of uh, people to sacrifice. But also men. I mean, men are also being sacrificed, being targeted and assaulted and tortured, human trafficked into weapons testing and non-consensual neurotech experimentation projects. And, you know, that actually brings us back to universities, which we kind of played with the idea of presenting this week and then decided against because we need to collect some information. But 
um, ethnicities are involved in non-consensual today. Can anyone believe that? Universities, our spaces of higher learning and higher education, are now working with defense and intelligence agencies, are in fact collecting huge gobs of money from these sources, and they are non-consensually experimenting on people. The whole implant system, no doubt, you know, the DOD and the CIA also have their own black, black ops doctors, no doubt, and their own black ops medicine that can deal with uh, implanting people in the exact right spots on their spine and the, and the back of the head in order to fully torture them and fill them up with biomens and nanotech and so on and so forth. But there are also universities that are engaging in this research that are taking research money from the DOD that are working in this space. And I think we can prove it. Well, I can tell you that one of my stalkers in Tallahassee had the vanity plate FSU, which it stands for Florida State University, but his vanity plate said F-S-U-P-R-O-F. -F. FSU, FSU Pro. professor. Very FSU professor. Mm -hmm. And some of the people they sent to stalk me were wearing uh, sorority or fraternity clothes. So, <laughs> you know, I know they were involved. Yeah, and right around me, you know, I get a few university uh, stickers and stuff in the backs of cars, particularly Bay State, which is, you know, sort of Massachusetts, it's known as the Bay State. And um, I have to look up if there's a Bay State University because I think it's the Bay State University a lot. And for... Um... I was looking for something that I found this morning when I was looking at universities that are involved in, in, in you know, in research. Students and actually uh, Oak Ridge Laboratory in a radiation experiment at the University of Massachusetts. That's really University interesting. University of Massachusetts that's is on my list. Yeah, that's right up the street. On my list. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and on the list of several others. I believe it. I mean, this is the Boston area, right? I mean, just just imagine what goes on over here. This this is sort of a hub for biotech, I think, and definitely for you know, for the, the, there's a ton of universities and colleges out here, and uh, it's a hub for various uh, various different focuses in science, you know, robotics. And you know, Vanderbilt also is doing a lot of robotics and artificial intelligence research, isn't it? Um, but MIT is right here, so yeah. MIT has a close connection with DARPA. Absolutely. And um, I think it was um, uh, Professor Daryl Hamamoto who mentioned on Alex Jones, I have to look up his interview, but he mentioned on Alex Jones how um, one of the um, one of the researchers at, um, he, so uh, Daryl Hamamoto is at uh, uh, University of California, Davis, and um, he is, um, he was saying that one of the researchers uh, publicized how um, uh, research was taken over by the defense industry and then was murdered for it. I think so. He he mentioned that. So um, I think what has happened. Um, sorry, I'm just getting a lot of feedback. I think it's Karen's microphone. Uh, I'll turn Karen, it off. You, uh, no, no, just just muted maybe just briefly, um, because I think they are amplifying certain background noises. But um, I think what has happened, and I think looking back at Oxford, I I, I suspect this is what I saw. I, even though I didn't recognize it at the time, is that this uh, huge criminal organized crime cartel is moving into universities now. It, it was always there, but it's now moving in, um, you know, in a very big way, and uh, huge defense uh, contracts are coming in, and uh, research is being entirely subverted for very nefarious purposes. And um, I would flag um, all the research into um, brain uh, computer interfaces, uh, a lot of the nanotechnology, um, and a lot of the uh, what's it called? Um, also, these these chip implants and and uh, biomedical um, prostheses as as actually uh, more organized crime than actual um, medical medical research. And the way to um, it, sound, it sounds very harsh, and this is not something I would have said before I did all my research, but um, the way to look at it is always as follows. Um, they always try to justify it by saying, oh, you know, we can help disabled people walk again and so on. And that's laudable, and that's exactly what research should do. However, when you see that um, they, they don't even uh, give enough money to, to lower the pavements so that people in wheelchairs can get about town, even though this is really cheap and really easy to do, when they can't be bothered to do that, you know that this is not about helping disabled people 
get around. You know, this is about actually building super soldiers, building weapons and controlling minds remotely and, and, and actually doing all the research that the, the targeted individuals are suffering from, you know. And indeed, and this information, this kind of research is actually being moved from the black ops world, which is what targeted individuals have been reporting for many years. It's being moved from that space into the public domain. So now we are seeing open projects that the DOD is actually publishing, open contracts with these particular focuses, you know, the Warfighter Enhancement Project, for instance, recently granted to Mayo Clinic. So ask yourself, you know, why are our health centers becoming involved with the Department of Defense? Because the Department of Defense is doing precisely what you are suggesting. They are couching this research in beneficial terms for soldiers, you know, for prostheses, for the enhancement of soldiers' capabilities on the battlefield. You know, glorify the battlefield is like a place that soldiers need to go. And uh, and then say that, you know, we've got to support our troops. We've got to give them the best possible help whatsoever. And um, therefore, we've got to do this research with Mayo Clinic or with um, Northeastern or Northwestern or, or NIT or wherever. And uh, we're going to pour all this money into this. So, you know, from the COVID ops world, it's, it's now coming into, pub, into public domain in, in a way to kind of um, acquire public consent, I think, public acquiescence, without enough knowledge as to what exactly is going on, how these, um, you know, how this equipment is going to be used and where it was tested and who it was tested on. So this whole phenomenon of TIs, I think, is um, judging from the way it's been set up, is possibly a thing that they can completely flag up as a mental health delusional problem while continuing to build whatever they're building, build their systems, build their weapon systems as much as possible. And then when they've completely uh, uh, polished and refined their weapon systems to the point at which they can um, completely afford to throw TIs away, then they, they may choose to withdraw. I don't know, because um, the, the rate at which it's continuing, the rate at which um, the horrific nature of targeting is continuing, and uh, it's not becoming something where people are openly speaking about it and openly working to stop it, suggests um, nefarious aims and intentions. Well, I have to say that um, there's somebody on, on Twitter who who gave a lead Absolutely. to a journalist. Sorry, I, um, I had difficulties activating my microphone. So, um, oh gosh, I, I sorry. Meanwhile, Millicent had to leave the chat because of a personal emergency that she has to mm -hmm. um, attend to. And I am very concerned about that. And I would like to um, flag that here live because I feel that this is retribution. So she just told us the details on um, why she had to go. And I feel that there's um, some physical retribution has happened. Um, by Randall Webster, the Air Force veteran who the FBI refuses to arrest. Um, and, um, you know, I, I, I basically, I would like to say publicly right now live that um, everything that happens to, um, to Millicent and her family and everybody involved, uh, you know, we will blame the FBI for it and we will blame the Air Force for it because they are the people who trained this uh, psychopathic serial killer. And, um, you know, anything that happens, uh, this is the fault of Randall Webster and the FBI and the Air Force, for sure. Yeah, and um, that's what he's doing. He's engaging in retaliation. Yeah, yeah he's, he's basically killing people. So if we speak out, he just goes out and kills people. And I want people to understand that this is the integrated weapon system whereby they have set it all up. So they, I, I already talked about how you can use mobile phone towers also, I think, to, um, to harm people. But there are these mobile directed energy units, which the intelligence agencies have on purpose distributed throughout the population that can shoot through walls, that can maim and mutilate you, that can, can give you bleeding, a heart attack, a stroke and brain damage through the walls of your house. 
And talking about brain damage, we should bring up that one article in AP yeah. you know, recently that's been reported elsewhere in the Daily Mail and so forth, where finally the people out in Cuba have um, have um, recognized that you know, what's been hitting those diplomats is possibly not sonic weapons, but possibly microwave weapons, because they've discovered some brain damage and some damage to the white matter of these um, particular diplomats. But this whole story is sort of you know fraught with um, information that's not that's being withheld and not being shared, obviously. And apparently there are people with gag orders out there, people who've been told they cannot speak to the press. And then even uh, the press articles, but of course we must remember this is AP, this is Associated Press. That's that's publishing this and the Daily Mail. This is totally within the realm of Operation Mockingbird. You know, they continue to flag this up as something that is a great mystery, a deepening mystery, a great puzzle, something that they can never fully understand. But, you know, you and I know that the CIA is perfectly aware of what's going on. The NSA is perfectly aware of the use of electromagnetic weapons. They've got whole departments of the DOD, you know, devoted to electromagnetic weapons, to microwave weapons, and to studying the bio effects of selected non-lethal weapons, which have been published. And I'm speaking specifically of a certain declassified document, bio effects of selected non-lethal weapons, which was, you know, produced, I think Donald Friedman did a FOIA in 2006, and he was he received that from the US Army. And uh, I, Millicent, the same FOIA request actually recently and she got the same document. But goes out, you know, that over time the Army, the US Air Force, um, the Navy most definitely have been studying bioeffects. You know, in addition to the Russians studying it and the Chinese studying it, the US guys have been studying it. They've been studying it and they've been publishing manuals about it. So they know very well what the bioeffects are. The, uh, the effects on the, on the, on the uh, physiology of the human being as to the assault of their bodies with microwave weapons or millimeter wave weapons or laser weapons. They've been studying this. They should know all about it. So this article, you know, is sort of fraught with deception. It's rife with duplicity to say that it's such a great mystery that, you know, nobody knows what's going on. And, and CIA officials being quoted in articles, FBI officials being quoted, US officials being quoted. It's an absolute joke. It's, it's, it's just yet another, you know, of those mainstream media cover-ups and uh, uh, inability to be truthful, inability to publish the truth or publish reality. So that's kind of, you know, how I see that entire story. There's another story, though, that I think is uh, of greater, um, you know, it's more optimistic looking at that story, and that is the story that was published recently in truthuncensored.net, which covered what's happening in the TI world, which covered the fact that, you know, NSC whistleblowers William Binney and Kirk Wiebe have come forward and are going to be the prime data analysts in this TI survey that's currently underway, where a lot of information has been collected from TIs around the world. Um, and this was, of course, managed by, you know, Kate Ryan and Carla Smith. And um, so so this is a wonderful article which gives credit to the people who are actually doing great work and who are trying to bring out this horror of targeting, surveillance abuse, weapons testing, and non-consensual neurotech experimentation into the light of day. Um, so the other thing that that article does is it, it also talks extensively about Karen's case in the NSA, about her whistleblowing, about the incredible retaliation that she's facing, the losses she's currently facing, and the fact that she has been outspoken about the use of um, these weapons by the NSA on her person which is, you know, kind of a wake-up call to everybody around the world that, hello, the NSA is perfectly aware that these weapons exist and furthermore is using these weapons on people. You know, the FBI is involved. Local law enforcement is involved. And then the great thing, of course, about this article is that it also talks about what we are doing, uh, what Catherine Horton is doing at her website. It, you know, it flags up stop007.org um, and talks about everything that Dr. Horton has brought to the table here. Uh, she's totally galvanized this, the discussion of targeting over the last year. I think hats off to her. And, and Catherine, you know, I do want to do a special interview with you um, on my new Interviews with Changemakers series. So we'll have to set a date and a time for that. Yeah, um, I, I, I 
I have told Ramola that I will do an interview with her under one condition, and that's if I can interview Ramola for my <laughs> channel because I think the world needs to have an interview with Ramola because she's big enough. So. And meanwhile, she omits to mention that she has been the only reporter, as far as I can make out, who's been consistently reporting about these crimes, you know, to top level for the past three years. So she has been actually an expert in this, you know, for she's been around reporting about this where when I wasn't even on the scene. So I'm just a little stupid puppy in comparison to her, you know. So we need an interview of her first. <laughs> We can do a mutual interview. <laughs> Definitely. You know, I have to say you're a dynamo. And I think, you know, we all we sometimes forget that you are a dynamo and you've kind of galvanized this, this entire space. And we need to give you credit for it. And we need to kind of, you know, profile you and highlight you and, and uh, applaud and celebrate you. And I do want to do that. So we will do that. So so, oh, great thing that, you know, and thank you, thank you, Catherine, about the journalism. Yes, and definitely you can, you're welcome to profile me anytime because God knows nobody else wants to. So, <laughs> I think the world needs to know because, um, yes. you know what, uh, people have to understand that when I don't know something, I ask Ramola, right, and, and Millicent, and they have done all the research, and then Ramola says, oh, yes, go to this article on my site that I published like two years ago, and there's everything in there, you know. So, well, that's where the real knowledge lies, you know. Oh, thank you. That's only because I've been running this kind of compendious, you know, solutions journalism kind of side for a while now, you know, and I've been following a few issues and I've been trying to, well, in some cases, just collect blog posts or repost other people's blog posts. You know, I'm all about celebrating activists and celebrating the work of others. And that's kind of what I'm what I've been trying to do at Everyday Concern. It's sort of been a very compendious, open-ended kind of site. Um, and it's only lately that I've kind of figured out that I'm actually engaged in, you know, investigative journalism and why don't I just move in that direction? So that's kind of where I've been going. And now I'm sort of in the sta space of, you know, um, science and technology journalism and surveillance journalism and defense journalism. And so I've decided, okay, now I'm a journalist. I'm not just, you know, running solutions journalism. I'm going to call myself an investigative journalist because what the heck, that's what I've been doing, you know? Exactly. So, so that's where we are as far as my writing is concerned. She's also, she also has encyclopedic knowledge, you know, so <laughs> she is my Google, you know. I just do voice search with her. I say, Ramola, what does this mean? <laughs> Oh, thanks, Catherine. So, so the the thing I also want to flag up is that you know the fact that this writer did a great job of also um, bringing to the fore the joint investigation team, everything that Catherine has set up, because she's kind of persuaded us to work together on this team, and you know we're very happy to do this together, and we I think are, you know, a wonderful team because despite our ups and downs, we really work with each other and help out each other and you know we're striving to to work together for other people because as you know as we started out saying this is a very very much a public interest project it's a public interest project for the whole world and uh, we're not seeking to say that we are kind of spokespeople for the entire world of ti's or anything like that but that we are inevitably we are very concerned about this issue and we are speaking out to the best of our abilities uh, to the best of our individual abilities and talents and skill sets, because each of us brings sort of a different skill set to the table and we are, you know, kind of throwing it out there as much as possible. And it's so pleasing and so um, gratifying to see someone uh, recognizing the work is all um, that I wanted to say about this particular article. It's at truthuncensored.net. And um, it uh, recognizes the work that, you know, we as Technocrime Fighter Forum is doing. Um, on this panel week after week because you know as you know we are taking out of our day to stop everything else that we are doing and um, just get together and talk about these things so that yeah. other people become aware and so forth yeah and also well, i think um we should stress that behind the scenes we are also working flat out um so ramola does a lot of the um interviewing of the um, witnesses and of the victims and um, this is part of the entire you know program of evidence collection so she has done yes. an absolutely amazing um, job and um, what I wanted to say let me just briefly share my screen I wanted to say that um, the joint investigation team for those who don't know it has a website it's called jointinvestigation.org and here um, under at the moment it's just the um, the, uh, the website but here under JIT reports we will be publishing soon reports about these crimes that you can quote in court um, they will be signed by all five um, members of the joint investigation team and um, those are the people here with the expertise um, and Melanie Richan is, is also part of it and we are putting our knowledge together and um, we're signing these reports so that you can actually 
um, use them in court, um, give them to friends, family, and um, and others, um, and actually have the the ultimate. Well, this won't be the last say in the in the matter. These um, GIT reports will be put out and updated as we go along. But the idea is to put it down in writing what actually is happening, and then um, inform everybody about it. But what I wanted to um, also say is that um, there are many, many more people who are investigating these crimes. And at the bottom of my YouTube channel, I in the section adult education, this isn't this isn't complete by any means, by the way. This is just a first taster. I ask absolutely everybody to go and um, learn from the many other investigators who are in the field. I mean, you know, William Binney and Kirk Wiebe, I think you should listen to absolutely everything they put out online because it's just so very important. Um, there are wonderful interviews with Karen Stewart, also Ramola, but also people like um, Mark Passio, who's been uh, reporting about this. And um, further down, I can't actually, uh, here. Um, there are many, many more, and you have to also cross fields. If you want to understand what's going on, you also have to understand you know what Eric Kallstrom says, for example, about global warming and um, the global warming uh, hoax and how that's being used. Um, also the financial realm, Catherine Austin Fitz, Jim Sinclair and Karen Hudis. I have um, linked a couple of videos, but many, many more. Um, with Catherine Austin Fitz, you also have to, I think, understand everything yes. that she's saying. And, um, and most, uh, most importantly, I also want all of you to go out and become your own investigators because the truth is this, this cartel and the crimes are far too big for us to just investigate on our own. So more than anything, we want all of you to start imitating us, improve on our methods, improve on anything that you see and keep helping, uh, you know, help us to make it better and to keep improving on this and also to keep collecting information and investigative leads about what's going on because there are many, many more aspects to these crimes. Yeah, and you know, I just wanted to say a word also about the general TI civil community. Many people talk about the fact that there, you know, there really is no single community and I kind of um, fall on that point of view actually. I, I, I don't really think there is one community, but I think there are many communities and I think that's actually a good thing because I think the more groups there are, um, the more small groups there are speaking out and putting this information out, I think the more powerful it will be ultimately for this message to get out to the world at large. It's not, you know, one umbrella organization with, you know, one set of spokespeople uh, presenting one particular idea. I don't think that's what's needed. I think what's needed is a chorus of voices. And um, if those voices are diverse, more, you know, the better it is because we're dealing with technologies here that are covert, that are clandestine, that not everybody can, you know, wrap their heads around. Not one person can stand up and say, I know all about it. Unless they're sort of, you know, deep inside the dark dark spaces of, you know, the CIA or whatever. But um, that's really not happening so far. So, you know, I, I really think it's it's a celebration of if different people form little groups of their own, you know, connect with people that you can connect with, that you find a commonality and, you know, a like-mindedness with and um, and work together, as Catherine says, you know, I'm all for that idea. Absolutely. I think it's powerful. And, and I think also we should... Um, um, I really want people to start um, picking out, uh, picking up the information that all the other investigators have been um, putting out. You know, I mean, I will mention some high-profile ones, but I, I want um, also to people to start go out and, and look for information on YouTube from people who maybe um, are not that well known because those people have a really wonderful nuggets and clues. But one of the things I would like to say: these are clues that we all need to to know about actually, and everybody who hasn't done it yet. Please, please watch A Good American. Find a way to watch this film. It's a, it's a, a, can you it's watch about, it online, Catherine? Do you know if you can watch it online? I or? think you can. I think uh, I, I'll show you something now that you ask. Um, so if you type into Google A Good it, American, if you type into Google A Good American, I have found, if you click on this link, I think you can watch the whole film online. Oh wow! Which I, I wouldn't. I don't want to undermine, you know, um, yeah. and the film. But in this case, it is so freaking important. You actually all do watch it. So please go to YouTube and watch this one here. It's here, mm. and as you can see, I have watched it here because I needed to have access to it as quickly as possible. And I also will be talking about it because there's much more in the film that's actually in the words, and that's also very important for us to understand. And I will make a video really? about this. Yes, uh, actually, there's a lot of. Um, Covert messages actually in the film 
that I don't think are intended by the people who are being interviewed on here. Mm -hmm. But you basically have to watch this film, okay, mm -hmm. uh, in so many levels. I think people need to understand what exactly the technology is that um, Bill Binney um, has developed and his team has put together. Mm -hmm. All right, I think everybody needs to understand what this is in, in their own way. Mm -hmm because we need to start looking for this technology because I my, my take on this is that this has is now being used against us. This was not developed to be against us. This was developed to be a protection. But I have the gut feeling that elements of this are now being used to come after us. You've just given okay. me an idea, Catherine. I think I'm going to be starting yet another podcast series on my on my channel called the Film and Book Review series. So yes, do because be the great film, idea? yes, it's a wonderful idea, and um, and I think um, I think uh, Catherine Austin Fitz does it as well. She she says there's a I think a podcast called Going to the Movies or something like that. I have to remember, but it's so important we all start looking, and that you have this podcast as well because there's so much covert cartel signaling in this. Yes, so and you know what I would love to do is I'd like to do roundtable book reviews and roundtable film reviews. Yes. You know, so just get together for every single film that's that's connected and related to everything that we are talking about. Um, get together a small group of people who you know are bursting with information to give us about their their opinions of the film. Just put them all together and do a little podcast, you know, and do it okay. do it for films and do it with books as well. I think this is brilliant. I think we need to start going out and actually do that. And then, you know what, Ramola, I would almost recommend that most of us, you know, go out and actually watch, you know, as a mandatory homework, a good American. Seriously, yes. every single person on the planet needs to see this film because it is so freaking important. And I'm telling you, there are several levels. On the first level, you need to hear um, absolutely everything that uh, Bill and Kirk and the others, um, Ed Loomis, um, are saying in the film, you need to understand what actually happened that led mm -hmm. to them blowing the whistle. Then you have to watch the film again and then you have to read between the lines and try to guess at what the technology that's being represented by this, what I think they call the big ass graph, is actually doing so you need to understand the technology you need to start reading between the lines and guess what how this thing works and what it can do and then you have to watch the film a third time and look at all the covert signaling that was i think put in by the director <laughs> and actually says a completely different story from the previous two you know That's and really for this reason for this reason this movie has to be seen by absolutely everybody okay um, seriously, I have to. I, I keep watching it, and every single time, I just keep seeing more stuff. But it's one of the most important films. But um, well, maybe that can be the first podcast that I do. You know, perhaps a few people, perhaps people can watch this and just send me an email if you'd like to be on the roundtable podcast discussing the film with Dr. Catherine Horton, and yeah. we'll do it. I, I think we, we really should. We really should. And um, so this is one thing I wanted to say, and there was so much more. Um, so yes, people need to go out and start grazing for information and start helping us find the people who have the clues and, and the puzzles. And uh, one of the things, I'm not sure, do we have um, two more minutes? I just wanted to give another clue, right? Um, we yes, were talking absolutely. about university. I don't know if Karen is here though. I, Karen, are you still yeah. here? Yes, I am. I am. I'm not sure. Maybe she muted the video. Sometimes she's listening to what what we're oh, saying sometimes she's listening but she's okay i just wanted to wa make sure that you know if she had something to say that you know we don't uh, forget that she's here and she needs to say it so. okay uh, can you hear me now i don't think i've switched off her mic but yeah, i maybe could from this maybe she did and okay i've switched can, off now I've, can you yeah. hear me now but in any case, okay, so go right ahead, Catherine. I guess we're sort of in the tail end of this podcast, so just exactly. go ahead and finish up. And if Karen comes uh, back, we'll conclude. Um, you know, talking about leads, because, um, you know, I was, um, so, so on my, my first, sorry, I, I hear echo back. Is that sorry, maybe my... I, I don't know. So uh, anyway, so basically what I'm also um, trying to encourage people to do, because there's so much we all need to understand and so many new concepts we need to learn. And um, I was trying to put out all these different trails. And on my Patreon account, my very first post is about a lot of leads and trails, you know, that people did, that investigators need to follow up. Anybody investigating this need to understand that. Um, but then I would like to put out um, a lead now that is, is extremely important. And because we were talking about universities, 
it might come as a surprise to many people that universities were taken over by um, you know the military intelligence uh, complex and so on you know that's not that surprising um, people might be more surprised to hear that a lot of the universities have been taken over by organized crime right straight out straight out of the box mafia organized crime and to bring home that concept I would like to start with my own alma mater which is Oxford the University of Oxford and I would like to point people to something and um, what is um, what has happened is that um, so I have seen some odd things happen at uh, St. John's College, Oxford, and related to St. John's College and so on, um, which I think is related to the intelligence agencies and the crime cartel, which I should mention another time. But I would like to point people to the following. Um, I would like to share my screen, and um, I would like to point out how in a previous episode I was talking about, um, oops, sorry, um, where's St. John's um, here? I was talking about, um, um, the City of London Corporation, okay, so the City of London um, Corporation or the City of London is within Greater London, it's the square mile, so let me just um, bring it up again, so City of London, um, and um, on Google Maps you can, you can see a highlight of the City um, of London within Greater London, okay, so this is this, is this bit, and what people don't know is that this bit is entirely wholesale owned by the Vatican, as far as I can make out, and has been for, um, you know, since time immemorial. Uh, and this area has been owned by the Vatican from, it's basically a different territory. And it goes back, and the, the, the rights of this territory go back to even before William the Conqueror in 1066. So this plot of land is ancient. Um, the City of London has, as I pointed out, St. Paul's Cathedral, but it also has the Bank of England here and uh, many, many other things. It also has, I think, the World HQ of Freemasonry <laughs> um, in there and many, many other, you know, nice uh, little outfits. Um, now, the City of London also has uh, the guilds, okay? So um, here's Guildhall that's highlighted here. And the, the different guilds in the city of London um, have, um, well, uh, strange rights, you know, and they are very, very, very powerful. And one of the things I discovered, so I used to um, be a fellow at St. John's College, Oxford, here. And when I looked at, um, if you go to the section called Discover About the College, there's a link to the history. And if you look under the history, so first of all, this college was founded in 1555 by Sir Thomas White, uh, a wealthy London merchant tailor. Okay, so that's interesting. But if you scroll down, you will find how Thomas White was master of the Ma Merchant Tailors Company, one of the most illustrious livery companies in the city of London. Okay. So um, these, the merchant tailors are one of these guilds inside the city of London. In other words, my old college was founded by the master of the merchant tailors company of the city of London. Now I just said, said that the city of London is owned by the Vatican. It's an extraterritorial area where the Queen of England has no rights. She has no right to be walking there. And every time when she visits this place, her bodyguards are basically dropped off here at the, at the border. And then the bodyguards from the City of London guilds take over and then take her to, you know, a big, uh, you know, celebration in the guild hall, I think. And Catherine, the ownership thing. stretches back to that time period, 1555, when the City of London was formed? Oh, way further than that. So my college, so <clears throat> basically St. John's College itself was founded in 1555. However... Oh, okay, um, this, that's what was founded so then. This, it, the, the college was founded in 1555. However, the rights of the City of London Corporation mm -hmm. go back to before 1066. It, it, and then beyond that, it's lost in the midst of time, you know, so... To the Vatican, to the Vatican. Yes, exactly, mm -hmm. exactly. And and today, the city of London it, it appears to be a tax haven, you know. It's, it seems to be a little, a little tax haven 
And this is the city of London. This is what's called the square mile. And then outside, everything inside the M25, this big motorway, that's Greater London. So you've got Greater London, and inside Greater London, you've got the city of London, that little bit. And these are two different things. Okay. Yeah, but it's interesting. Now, it's right in this, almost at the center, right? Yes, and and actually, the city of London is within the old city walls. So I think there are bits of the city walls still left here oh, on wow. the on the east side. And you've got the Tower of London right at the bottom here in the corner. Oh, the Tower, is of, that London. The Tower of London is okay. Yes, and and I think this thing. <laughs> Yeah, and this thing is Tower Bridge. So you've got oh, Tower okay. Bridge and then the city, uh, sorry, the Tower of London, and then you've got the city of London. And um, these things, the Tower and the, especially Tower Bridge, are featuring in the video I've just posted on Patreon. And there's lots of. Um, Brilliant. Uh, but so it's, it's all these are all clues. But what I wanted to say is that my old college seems to have been founded by the Vatican. Okay? So oh, it seems wow. to be. You know, this is the this is the uh, connection. It's also called, you know, Saint John the Baptist College and so on. And another thing I would like to point out, it has this crest, okay, so this funky mm -hmm. crest. But in the top um, left hand corner, it has this dragon, and it's kind of I'm not sure if people can see it's here as a watermark in the background. Oh yeah. And this dragon, when you look at it, its tail looks like flames. Oh yeah. Like flames, and then its tongue is stuck out. And remember the um, City of London Boundary that Dragons? So City of London uh, Boundary Dragons. Um, if I look at the images, um, these little dragons also have their tongue stuck out, right? So this sticking out one's tongue, yes? Yeah. yeah. Uh, here, as you can also see on, uh, on this one, on, mm -hmm. on this lion or whatever that is. This isn't the dragon, this is a lion. Um, that seems to have some connection as well to the Vatican, the sticking out the tongue thing. <laughs> and isn't that on the royal crest and everything? Those two, are they lions or are they dragons on either side of uh, the center, so, whatever it is? Yeah, that's that's actually very interesting. So this dragon, it's not that dragon that's on the crest. Actually, let me, let me oh, show okay. you what the royal crest looks like. But that's very interesting as well, because a royal uh, crest... Um, if you look at it, you're right because it has a lion and it has a unicorn. So maybe oh, there let, you me, go. Yeah. let me find a high definition image here. And um, actually, traditionally, um, when you look at this image, um, so I said this this is the royal crest. Okay, so um, that represents the royal family, and then you've got this uh, belt around it. Okay, and then you have the lion and the unicorn sticking out their tongue in a <laughs> funky way. And both the tail of the lion looks like flames and the tail of the this thing, this unicorn, looks like flames. And then what's also funky is that the hooves of the unicorn look more like the hooves of a goat. Oh, yeah. Does anybody find that odd? And then what's also the odd hooves. is that... Exactly. And the lion looks very much like it's saying, yeah, I want to have a piece of the, you know, a piece of this crest. Mm, okay. Yeah. So the question is, if this, the crest represents the royal household, what does the lion and what does the unicorn represent? And actually the unicorn features in many, many, look, it has a crown around its neck and a chain and it's tied down. So it looks like the unicorn is somehow chained by a crown, if you like, perhaps the crown corporation. Oh, and then yeah. the lion is wearing a crown. And then look, you have the, this looks like the... Yes, royal. I was going to say, there's another lion right on top with another yes, crown. Exactly. Yeah. exactly. There's a, the lion seems to be on top of the crown. And then if you look carefully, the crown itself has the, the fleur-de-lis here. Oh, yeah, the fleur-de-lis. Also the Maltese cross, oh, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, oh my God, you know, so the, the actual crest in itself is a story, another story. But yes. um, going back, so there's all these connections to, to what looks like the Vatican. But just to finish off, um, so if you if you look at this, actually, there's, um, I think we have to finish because we, um, you know, we, yes, we do have to pick off. <laughs> yeah. and, and, then, and then basically, I just want to put this out as a lead and I ask people to look at other colleges. I've also been at Hartford College and there's uh, many things I can say about Hartford College as well. But, um, you know, people need to start following these leads and um, they shouldn't be surprised. Um, you know, we've, we made this case that the Vatican is actually, 
you know, taken um, deep captured by organized crime and has been for millennia. And now if the Vatican owns the city of London, you know, corporation and the city of London corporation founded St. John's College, do not mm -hmm. be surprised to find, you know, organized crime somehow mm -hmm. having a hold over St. John's College, Oxford. And I wish I somebody had told me this before I went to St. John's College, mm -hmm. Oxford. But you could have known, Catherine, I mean, pretty much because every university is at this point completely infiltrated. The secret societies, you know, the Vatican, etc. cetera, they're, they're, they're sort of the underlying, the network, they're sort of the mesh network underneath what we see, you know, we just go in as students to these universities. We've yeah. been so unwitting in the past, but I think this kind of stuff is kind of coming out right now and thanks to the work of many great researchers. But interestingly, what it points to is that our societies have been so utterly taken over. So what we are seeing now, the crime and the corruption that we are seeing now and that we are being victimized by is uh, really connected to something that's centuries old. And as you say, it's been organized as a syndicate over decades and centuries and, and reflects the aims and agendas and you know nefarious intentions of these politics um, who really need to be dethroned along with the crests and the crowns. Sorry, but there you go, you know, and the population because the populace is not going to take kindly to it. So, yeah. <laughs> yes, <laughs> and then, you know, you know, my stance actually, ironically, I mean, the royal households had to be um, in with the organized crime cartel for centuries for survival. But ironically, I also put out this, uh, you know, this notion that actually the organized crime cartel seems to go after the royal households, even though it's not obvious at first. I think this is the long term plan. So, you know, mm -hmm. it's very curious what's going to happen. Next. Before. Yeah. And I, I'm looking forward next time, perhaps we can do a lot more on universities. I should also say I'm going to be talking with, um, you know, Jeff Godwin pretty soon about some of these subjects and some of the subjects raised um, in our previous Techno Crime Fight Fighters Forum, which is about child abuse and again, secret societies and, you know, these uh, ritualistic religions and so on and so forth. Um, and I'm hoping that that will be another fruitful venture that we can keep talking with him because he seems to have a lot of inside knowledge. And so I'm really happy to be working with him on that. So looking forward, you know, to the continuous dissemination of, exp of, uh, of information uh, <laughs> and the continuous proliferation of podcasts and Patreon sites and so on and so forth. Um, you know, let's, let's look on the bright side. There's all sorts of ghastly things happening to us and around us, but... Um, we're pretty brilliant people, I think, and we can, you know, we can uh, break out of this. Yeah, that's my hope. Yes, and we've got also the support of all the other many brilliant people, and we also know that there are, uh, you know, I'm, I'm talking to people daily who need our support, and we are aware that there are thousands of victims around the world. And I think we should now come together and and fight all this. And uh, basically, anybody who's in in Tennessee, for example. Um, you know, should now um, really band together and and um, try to have this crime network shut down. You know, and anybody who's not in Tennessee should also help us to, um, you know, put pressure on the FBI, put pressure on NSA and also the Air Force to have Randall Webster shut down at last because um, Millicent really needs um, surgery. She needs our support more than ever. And I ask absolutely everybody to start writing to the FBI and start writing to Donald Trump um, and specifically ask for, you know, at last the mutilation of Dr. Millicent Black to be stopped, you know. Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. Yes, I think we do need to ask people's help for Millicent. Uh, Millicent is, you know, she's both a flagship case for this country and for the world. And, and she's also somebody who's being extremely victimized. So yes. literally, she, she needs a, advocacy. She needs people to step forward and, you know, act yeah. on her behalf. And also, then she, she is a Guineira. top researcher. I want people to know that she's a top researcher and she has put together material that is absolutely mind boggling you know, that we're all using. And I'm, I'm so angry. And today I utterly lost it because I just, I just can't handle the ridiculousness of it. And so I really want people to get angry with me, you know. And, and Karen and I can, you know, can give witness to the fact that Millicent is also a powerful prayer, prayer warrior. She never heard anybody pray like Millicent does. I mean, she can bring the heavens down when she prays. She's, she's just a powerful public speaker, powerful voice. And I've read her affidavits, her court statements. She's a powerful writer as well, you know, and um, hopefully we'll continue to showcase her work. I have a lot of ideas for putting her work out there and putting her voice out there. But we've got some basic communications issues where people are hacking into her computer, you know, so we kind of need to 
figure out how to deal with that. Yeah, and I want people to know because it's so frustrating. What what the sabotage does is that it frustrates. Um, you know, it tries to frustrate people who are listening to Manasand. And um, what this guy does is he cuts out everything that's really valuable that she says. And we have Skype calls with her when we can hear her fine, and she totally blows us off off our feet with the knowledge she has, and she can't show it because she's being hacked nonstop. And it's, it is so upsetting. I, I really, I, I'm going to write a, you know, a, a complaint letter to NSA, and I'm just going to talk about it publicly, that it's, they are an embarrassment. They're an embarrassment because they can't seem to secure the, the, the digital architecture in, in just, a, you know, just on a doorstep. I mean, what a bunch of incompetence do they have to be? I mean, how many, frankly, how many, literally, how many rookies does it take in NSA, all these like cyber, you know, hacking kids, to just repair her laptop remotely, you know? If, if we can get somebody to, to just, you know, a, a, have access to your laptop remotely, you pay them and they can report, repair that. I mean, could they please repair uh, Millicent's laptop? Could they please get Randall Webster and his team mm -hmm. of thugs off her laptop? Could they, could they just put up some sort of communication link between her and Google Hangouts so that we can talk to her, you know, just as a project? You know, for these kids, would that not be the first step to restore national security to the United States? You know, oh, I don't the think the NSA cares project. about national security. So uh, I'm not seeing much evidence of that. Yeah, no. And with regards to Millicent. Yeah, and and but this is it because um, you know, uh, and, it, and I, sorry, I just want to finish off with a serious note on defense. In the olden days, right? Defense, how it actually was when we're talking defense, not just about corruption and lies. Um, when you're trying to defend a fort, right, and this is a mistake that I, uh, I gather from historical work, you know, books on history, people, you know, screwed up every single time. If you want to secure a fort, right, you have to secure it absolutely everywhere, all around. And typically what happened is that the, 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 um, the walls have been um, repaired in the posh parts of town and the rich parts of town. And in the slums, they let the walls rot. So when uh, an army came, they came through the walls that were just next to the slums because these, the walls were rotten and you could just walk straight in, right? So there's no point having fancy walls in the rich parts of town when the army can walk in through the poor parts of town. And this is a perfect analogy because the organized crime cartel is taking down the US, not by going through the fancy parts of town in Washington DC, but by going through you know, um, the African American communities all around the country. And um, Millicent's community is one of them. Yes, actually, well, that's a good point because Mount Pleasant, where she is reporting that large numbers of people, many of whom she knows because, you know, through church congregations and church activities and so on, a, a large population is indeed African American. So I, this is this is definitely a story to to pursue and to investigate and explore further. Because it does talk, you know, it, there's a direct relation to eugenics over there. Yes. Exactly. And that's the other thing. But um, exactly. And, um, and, and just to finish off, I just want to say that, um, you know, uh, if, if the NSA, these arrogant, overpaid, feckless jerk offs at NSA laugh at the cases um, of Millicent, I have got news for them. Because when you really want to secure the digital architecture, especially in a networked society, you have to secure it absolutely everywhere. So when you have literally cartel guys, you know, working for foreign power, running amok and actually, you know, accessing your satellite systems and your digital systems from Columbia, Tennessee, and you don't do anything about it, you know shit all about defense, you know jack shit about networks, and you will certainly know absolutely nothing about cybersecurity. And that's the NSA for you, you know? And at that point, they need to be defunded. And, you know, yeah, I think there's not. a distinction between the good guys and the bad guys, right? I, I hear often about the white hats and the black hats. So, you know, you've got the Nazis and the lunatics inside these intel agencies, you know, who are running amok and doing all this. And literally, look at what they're doing. They're destroying the reputation of this country and they're destroying the reputation of this country's intelligence agencies and security agencies. I mean, every other country in the world must be laughing their heads off. Yeah, they are. I think yeah. so, they are. And, and literally, they, you know, the FSB, the, the formerly the, the KGB, you know, for all their faults, I mean, th now they, and they must be wetting themselves just watching us week in, week out. Literally, wetting themselves laughing. 
and and it's fair enough you know it's totally justified because this is pathetic and uh, for, to all those people from nsa who say that there are any white hats left in nsa could they please repair medicine's laptop and ensure yes, communication I, to google hangouts to those white hats yeah if there yeah. are any yeah, could they please get on the case help now? Melissa, please help yeah. all of us. You know, actually, I have to say, I've been noticing that my I'm not being so majorly assaulted anymore when I'm on this particular podcast on the Google, on Google Hangouts. I'm actually kind of surprised because you remember there was a period where I couldn't even speak. They were hacking into my audio so much. And then I stopped using Google. I started to look into live streaming options. I mean, I'm still looking into live streaming options. But as soon as I started looking into it, suddenly somehow Google Hangouts has improved. It's a bit like the effect, by, you know, somebody pointed me to the effect that if you've got problems with a Windows laptop, the best thing to do is to open Google and search, you know, for Apple laptops and then your problems <laughs> usually repair themselves. It could be something like that. Because you know? I'm definitely looking for other live streaming options at this point, you know, because I want something that I can rely on in a pinch that I can just switch on and get started. You know, I don't want to have my audio and video constantly messed with and I'm going to have to become some kind of producer trying to figure out what's wrong. I'm not a producer. <laughs> so, uh, you know, it makes it easier for me to just have a platform I can rely on. So I don't know. I don't know. Perhaps they think I'm some kind of advertisement for Google now. <laughs> Who knows? But, well, you know, me... this is what needs to happen for Millicent. I think in Millicent's case, her laptop needs to be cleaned out. And her, when she gets on Google Hangouts with us, you know, she needs to be able to speak and be heard because her voice is extremely valuable. This nation needs to hear her voice. Randy Webster is not the voice we need to hear. You know, we don't need to hear the voice of Jeffrey Dahmer and Ted Bundy and um, what are the other guys? Charles Manson and, and Randy yeah. Webster, you know. We don't need to hear their voices. We need to hear the voices of the people whose lives they have destroyed. So, uh, can you hear me at this point, Karen? Uh, I can't hear you. Okay. All right. Can you hear me now? At all? No. Can Can you unmute her on your end, Ramona? Am I Am I muted? Just try it, maybe. I'm trying to, um, I, you know what, I wonder okay, if it's can you kind hear me of frozen all? over here. Can you hear me at all? I, I'm trying talking to. talking about um, sabotage, literally. Yeah, so okay. as I'm speaking about Google Hangouts being so great, look what they do, huh? <laughs> yeah, exactly, so, you so that reminds that us. Establishing that I do need another live streaming option here. So, <laughs> Karen, can you unmute yourself? Because, um. It's totally frozen at this end. I can't do anything. You can't do it from your end. I have. I have. We can't hear you. You have to, you have to type it into chat. Oh, wait, wait. Now it's working. No, now we can hear you. Okay, can you, can okay. you hear yes. me now? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay, I wanted to say real quickly that Millicent sent me something that says HR... Uh, I think it's 6357, and it is a bill that basically says you cannot extrajudiciously murder American citizens. So we need to investigate that and see, is it recent or ha was it passed years ago? I'm not sure. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. So that's definitely investigate that. It is. It is. Um, because, you know, there are these extrajudicial targeting lists, as you've spoken about as well, Karen, and I think we need to put that together along with, what is it, the President's Surveillance Program? Yeah, I'll add to my, uh, my petition wording, which basically I'm sending out people to people now um, upon request, because you can just send it in to anyone you want to send it in. In fact, I was going to give you an example of the fact that one woman has told me that a friend of hers or somebody who is known by her sent the petition itself to Orange County, the Orange County Council. Okay. And she says that it made uh, quite a stir, that people are discussing it and quite upset by it. And I said, there you have one person taking something that has been provided by somebody else and utilizing it and making an impact. 
So that's exactly what we're talking about is that we throw out ideas and other people run with them or it gives them ideas that they run with and by golly, they get results or they, you know, start people talking. Mm Mm-hmm. So that was great news. And is that um, you keep a simple as, document or is that your, is that a oh, new no, petition? that was, yeah, that was the, no, that was the old petition from September 2nd, which mm-hmm. now I have to go back and add the HR uh, 6357 about extrajudicially ju- murdering Americans. So I'm going to go and go back and add that to it as well. Oh, okay. So that's your, do- that's your long petition where you actually cite each and every one of the statutes and, um, bits from the code right from the u.s code right right and believe me that's not all of it i just tell them in the letter this is a sampling of the laws that are being broken and you're looking at four pages of laws being broken or oaths being broken or something like that but like Mm -hmm. i said you know we throw out these ideas and these documents and we say okay guys you run with them because you may think of uh giving them to somebody we didn't think of giving them to you know Mm -hmm. um so as, as if we generate enough and uh, you know that people can use it but i also want to say that there are so very many people who are are our eyes and ears besides our own investigation that they are sending magnificent articles to us i just received one uh regarding a man named mike beck who was an nsa counterintelligence agent and uh we'll have to talk about that more later but he and a fellow counterintelligence agent went to a foreign country that was hostile toward us were hit by microwaves and now um, more than 10 years later actually 10 years after they went which was 1996 they both came down with parkinson's disease and the person he went with died from whatever you know parkinson's or something last year and he's been trying to get uh, compensation from the Department of Labor, and they're saying, "Where's your proof?" So he's running into the same problem we are. So it's that's a very really good article. Yes, that's a very important case, I think, for us to know about and to publish information about. Right. Um, yeah, there is a lot of information that you know we kind of need to put together because it's it's standing. Yes. That's... Yes. So that's a very important article. And it was sent to me by, you know, at least two people. So I want to thank people because they're basically, they have a place to focus their research and send it. And I'm mm-hmm. very grateful, you know. Yes, it's absolutely. A, and this it's is a team kind of- much bigger. It's a team much bigger than what you see on Techno Crime Fighters. Yes. And when I said, you know, we're a brilliant bunch, that's who I meant. I didn't mean just us. You know, I wasn't just self-congratulating over here, but I was trying to say, you know, we are all together. We are a powerful people, you know, and uh, many of us have been targeted because we are outspoken and we are thoughtful and we are capable and competent and we are good writers. This is why we've been targeted. And, and therefore, you know, let's not forget that we have these wonderful talents and just put them to good use and keep using them and, you know, have faith in our own vitality and, and, and that's kind of what I meant. But um, on this note, actually, Karen, what I wanted to say also was this other idea that I recently shared with a few of you. And um, Chris Burton is running with that idea and is going to help me, he says. He's going to help set up a wonderful content management site for us where literally, um, you know, a group of us, those of us who want to be engaged in this venture, um, work together and publish together you know on the space we publish articles together so and maybe a small group maybe two or three people can vet each other's articles or edit or proof or whatever to help each other out but you know literally this is a way of sharing information so anytime you have a link you want to share or a video or an article you want to draw people's attention to you just put it out there together on this central site and you do it as a group you know it's kind of a publishing co-op that we just do ourselves and um chris burton is a brilliant publisher and worker in in this area and he's got a lot of ideas so uh, we talked a little bit last night and he's going to set it up for us and you know he's going to set it up so that it can work for us so my only criterion was you know keep it super simple and let's make it happen immediately (laughs) you know we can fine tune it as we go along but let's start right away (laughs) excellent looking forward to it that's great Brilliant. So lots of good ideas. Things are going to happen and we're going to make them happen. We're all going to make them happen together. So do join us. Stay focused. Join us next week. And on that note, if anyone else doesn't have a closing note. 
Okay, we'll say goodbye for this morning and we'll see you next week. Have a great week, everyone. Bye-bye.